Okay, welcome everybody. It is 631. Uh, my name is Laura Caps. I'm uh, honored to open up this meeting on November 10th, 2020, uh, Santa Barbara Unified School District Board of Education meeting, open session. Uh, I will turn it over to Ms. Rubacalva for Spanish interpretation. Good evening, everybody. I will be giving this an interpreting announcement in both English and Spanish, and we will also add it to the chat. Muy buenas noches. Vamos a dar este anuncio en inglés y en español, y también lo agregaremos al chat. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bidirectional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you don't have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language. In order to hear the interpretation, you will have to select your language. If you are on a laptop or desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. So you will click on that globe and select English. If you are on an iPad or a phone, you will locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English and click done. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear and speak at a moderate pace. Thank you. Muy buenas noches. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tendrá que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Hará clic ahí y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o su teléfono, Localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas, elija español y aceptar. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso moderado. Gracias. Are there any questions with regards to interpretation? If not, then we can go ahead and begin and I will ask the host to now assign me as an interpreter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rubacalva. So now uh, item C3, please, which would be uh, Superintendent Maldonado to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. We will now uh, face our flag on our Zoom screen. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. And uh, item C4, which is announcement of closed session action. There, were not, there was no action taken in closed session. So with that, we will turn it back to you, Superintendent Maldonado, uh, uh, for your superintendent's report, item C5. Thank you very much. We have a couple of recognitions this evening. I wanna start with uh, the first one a couple of weeks ago. I had the honor of being Mr. Virgil Elings uh, at Dos Pueblos High School where we did a little groundbreaking. And I'm gonna ask Mr. Ross to show us a, a picture of our groundbreaking at Dos Pueblos. Uh, many of you who are more seasoned and knowledgeable about uh, Santa Barbara philanthropists and generous folks would recognize Mr. Elings as someone who has really led in this community with, uh, and has been extremely generous to us with uh, donating towards capital projects such as the Ealings Performing Arts Center, the Ealings Aquatic Center, and the Ealings Center for Engineering Education in Dos Pueblos High School. We wanna recognize the legacy that Mr. Ealings has and we want parents to know what an amazing opportunity their children have when they attend Dos Pueblos High School and make use of so many of these facilities. And I believe so strongly that these partnerships and the philanthropy in this community is what makes a big difference for many of our families. So I personally wanna thank Mr. Elings for all of his generosity and support of our school system. With that, um, and acknowledge of course, this longstanding partnership with the Dos Pueblos Education Foundation. I've asked Mr. Uh, Daniel Hudson, president of the DPEIF to also say a few words on behalf of Mr. Elings. Mr. Hudson, are you with us? Hi, hi, I am. Um, thank you, uh, Hilda, for the opportunity to speak here. Um, the DPA AF, the Engineering Academy Foundation has partnered with the Santa Rosa Unified School District for the last 13 years. Um, 
which began with the capital campaign for the Ealing Center for Engineering Education. And we, we really are thankful for this partnership um, and everything that, as, as you've already said, uh, it's providing for the students of Sa the Santa Barbara community. Um, we, Virgil has been a great supporter of the Engineering Academy Foundation um, for, the, for the last 10 years at least um, and, and really understands the impact and the vision that of the Engineering Academy Foundation and the impact it's having on uh, the communities, the community as a whole. So uh, we're really excited to have Virgil support leading this $16 million project um, that is going to add 30,000 square feet of highly specialized CTE facilities to the DP engineering or Dos Pueblos High School campus. So again, we are very fortunate for Virgil's support and everybody else in the community who has made this possible. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of our school district and on behalf of all the children who will be impacted for generations to come. Thank you so much for being here. Next, I want to also acknowledge that three of our board members are here with us in person as we're getting ready to all come back to in person and while social distancing, wearing our masks and washing our hands, of course. Um, you can see here that Ms. Jackie Reed, Ms. Rose Munoz, and actually Dr. Jackie Reed, Ms. Rose Munoz, and Ms. Wendy sims -Moten. And with that, I want to uh, ask us to take a moment to recognize our wonderful board member, Dr. Jackie Reed. Uh, this is going to be her last meeting. Dr. Reed has been a champion for student voice for the last four years on this board, always advocating for equity and ethnic studies, just to name a few of her areas of interest. We have several members of our community here to share a few words of gratitude. And I'd like to start off with, we have a teacher, a student, a principal, uh, two parents from our DLAC committee, and of course our uh, former superintendent, Mr. Kerry Matsuoka is joining us, but we're gonna start with Mr. Joe Velasco, our teacher, um, to start with uh, him and we'll just go ahead and go in that order. So Mr. Velasco, are you with us? Yes, I am. I'm gonna put everybody in gallery view so I don't have to look at myself there. There we go, now I can see everybody. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I was asked to come and speak both as, as a teacher in the district for 20 years and uh, as a parent as well of one uh, Don alum and a current Don at Santa Barbara High School. Um, really want to thank um, the board and particularly uh, Jackie Reed for their leadership in making sure that the ethnic studies requirements as a, cla as a class um, became a requirement, became a reality this year with the class of 2024. And um, what a powerful experience it's already been uh, in the short amount of time that we've rolled out the classes. Um, having uh, Dr. Reed as, as a champion for student voices and our parents that, that um, I find it interesting that it was an all female board that pushed this through. Um, there's, there's a lot to be said for um, the leadership and, and the vision that you've had for creating not only a requirement and, and fighting through the clutter and the noise and the naysayers, because today we just had Josefina Lopez, an amazing playwright who wrote Where Women Have Curves, just did a webinar for our students. Um, I just finished interviewing her and I'll make sure that you all have, are able to see that as well uh, with a really powerful message about intersectionality, about student voices, about um, diversity, et cetera, and a message that we definitely need to hear in an age after the last four years of divisiveness um, we're, we're entering a new era despite the pandemic. Um, and so I just wanted to honor Dr. Reed and say thank you so much for being that champion for us and your time in the board because um, I had the pleasure of meeting you in Palm Springs of all places, having dinner um, and just really struck by your energy and your, your passion for our students. So thank you, thank you, thank you for making ethnic studies a reality. Thank you, Mr. Velasco. And now Maya Samaracena from Dos Pueblos, correct? Yeah, hi. Um, good evening, Superintendent Maldonado, President Caps, and members of the board. My name is Maya Samaracena, and I'm a senior at Dos Pueblos High School. I'm here today to talk to you about Dr. Jackie Reed. As a young 
queer woman of color, activism is in my blood. High school has always allowed me a place to grow and find groups that empower me to speak up for those who can't. Fighting for systemic and social change is the only place I can imagine myself being, and I owe it to Dr. Reed for creating safe spaces for myself and others to talk about our experiences. Um, and because of her continuous advocacy for the student voice, youth perspectives are now included into conversations within the school board. I'm in, I am lucky enough to be a part of the superintendent student advisory board. And even after our first meeting, I started to see the change and inclusivity that our student leaders strive for. The legacy that she, cre she has created amongst students, parents, teachers, staff, and others will live on for many years to come. Thank you for all your hard work and dedication, Dr. Reed. It has not gone unnoticed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, for being here with us as well. And now, Principal Veronica Binkley from Harding Elementary. You have to unmute yourself, Veronica. You would think I'd know that by now. <laughs> Good evening, Superintendent Maldonado, members of the board and SBUSD cabinet. I, as many of you had ha have had the privilege to work with Dr. Jackie Reed for the past six years, and have always found her to be such a positive and supportive SBUSD board member. Her inquiries are not only driven by a desire to make sure that only student voices are heard, but that all voices are heard. An example of this priority was her outreach to hear all community member voices, members' voices with several open forums with our parents, our partners, and our staff, which was very well received and attended. It has been an honor to work with you, Dr. Reed. Thank you, Principal Binkley. Now we have a uh, DLAC advisor to the president, Laura Gomez, Senora Gomez. Ah, uh, sí. Buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Laura Gomez. Soy copresidenta del DLAC. Uh, y en representación de todos los padres de estudiantes emergentes multilingües, quiero agradecer a la doctora Jackie Reed por su excelente trabajo. Es importante destacar que ella inició por primera vez los reconocimientos a los representantes del DILAC. También asistió a nuestras reuniones comunitarias, demostrando siempre su gran uh, apoyo incondicional y gran disposición para escucharnos. Trabajó arduamente por la equidad en todos los aspectos. Por esto y mucho más, doctora Reed, queremos... Perdón, me emociono. Queremos que se lleve en su corazón nuestro profundo agradecimiento, pues personas como usted son las que nuestra comunidad necesita para cerrar la brecha que existe de desigualdad. Le deseamos todo lo mejor en donde quiera que vaya y en todos sus proyectos. Dios la bendiga. Gracias. Muchas gracias, señora Gómez. Ahora la señora Margarita Mendoza. Now, Ms. Margarita Mendoza, DILA Co-President. Sí, buenas noches. Soy Margarita Mendoza, copresidenta de DILAC. Hoy me gustaría reconocer y agradecer a la doctora Jackie Reed por su gran desempeño que realizó en este cargo que llega a su término hoy y por el apoyo que siempre nos mostró al grupo de DILAC. Ella, con gran entusiasmo, era una de las primeras en alzar la mano en apoyo a nuestras recomendaciones. Gracias infinitas. Doctora Ray, usted con su generosidad podemos lograr cambios muy importantes en nuestra comunidad. Recordaremos con honor que usted destacó la valiosa idea de otorgar reconocimientos a cada uno y cada una de, la, de los participantes que con esfuerzo donan el valioso tiempo para atender ILAC y DILAC. Por el resultado, es y será un, un emotivo detalle que siempre será muy apreciado por nosotros. Gracias. Bonita noche. Gracias, señora Mendoza. Thank you so much, Mrs. Mendoza. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Kerry Matsuoka, our former superintendent. 
Uh, thank you, Superintendent Maldonado, for the chance to say a few words about Dr. Reed. That's you, Jackie. You look kind of small in that big board room. So good to see you. Oh, Jackie, I, I treasured our, our time together. Um, we were such great partners. Uh, we went through a lot together uh, as leaders of Santa Barbara Unified, and I will always remember um, your courage, your dedication. Uh, I just want to begin by saying thank you. Uh, the work of a board member is, is really thankless. Um, you put in hours and hours um, as a board member, and most people don't see that and appreciate it. Just know that I appreciate it deeply. Um, some moments, uh, some memories. I remember very early, Jackie, uh, how quickly we calibrated on leaders and leadership. Um, as you got to know our leaders, as you got to know me, it just it was, I really treasured those conversations as we thought about the, the principles of our schools and the members of our leadership team. And you have a keen eye for leaders uh, and that's a great quality for a board member. Uh, it's been mentioned already about your commitment to equity, cultural proficiency. I know you are very proud of, of what Santa Barbara Unified has accomplished these last four years. And it was your push um, that really got us to move forward um, with the ethnic studies grad requirement. So well done there. And I also saw you work uh, more than 40 hours a week, probably 50 or 60 at your own job. Uh, as an educator and that practitioner's perspective, um, you were in the trenches in your own way uh, as a teacher and as a leader. And people didn't see that as well, but I certainly did. Um, you brought that perspective to our conversations one-on-one -on -one and at the boardroom. So I predict your work as a leader and as an educator is not done. Um, you have too many passions and gifts um, that you will continue to give. So. Uh, thank you so much for your service and glad I got a chance to say these words to you, at least via Zoom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Matsuoka. I am here now with Ms. Kenny Barnwell and uh, board members. If we can go ahead and start, uh, we have a special certificate to recognize you with Dr. Reed uh, that we have prepared. If you can just come and stand in front of your seat here. This is a carefully orchestrated meeting in COVID conditions. Okay. So um, this just in front of perfect. your sign there. Yeah, perfect. And we'll start with Ms. Caps. If you can. Thank, you. Yes. Thank you. Okay, here's the beginning of the resolution. Whereas Dr. Jacqueline Reed has dedicated her life to education, serving as a tireless advocate for students, families, and staff of the Santa Barbara Unified School District as a board trustee 2016 to 2020, and as a teacher, teacher educator, and community leader in Santa Barbara through her work with UCSB, Antioch University, and the Tri-Counties Anti-Defamation League, ADL. Whereas Dr. Jacqueline Reed's strong commitment to equity through her support of district initiatives such as META, Multilingual Excellence Transforming Achievement, PEAK, College Readiness and Access Program, Cultural Proficiency Training, the Mandatory Ethnic Studies Curriculum, and the Black Lives Matter Resolution has heightened awareness and upheld students of color throughout the district. And whereas Dr. Jacqueline Reed's thoughtfulness, courage, diplomacy, and breadth of knowledge have inspired creative problem solving, collaborative thinking, and resolution-oriented approaches around sensitive topics and challenges. Whereas Dr. Jacqueline Reed has served as, an, as a community and student-centered advocate, inviting and including a diverse range of perspectives and voices into the board meetings, as well as during community and school-based gatherings. Whereas Dr. Jacqueline Reed's Coffee with the Board sessions have fostered open lines of communication between students, parents, and staff at schools and members of the governing board, inspiring new perspectives and approaches and greater understanding. And whereas Dr. Jacqueline Reed has served as a fierce champion of social justice, environmental education, and social emotional mental well being, helping to inspire learning and growth from early childhood through college and career, 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Santa Barbara Unified School District and the Superintendent of Schools express their sincerest gratitude and appreciation to Dr. Jacqueline Reed for her long-time commitment to the students, families, and educators of our district and community and best wishes for health, prosperity, and continued success in her work and life. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, do I speak? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm speechless, really. Um, I vowed that I would not get emotional just because it's just coming here. But um, and it's really hard to talk with this mask on. But um, I appreciate um, this opportunity, this uh, opportunity to be on this board. You know, it's been a privilege and an honor to be on this board. And um, I actually have a little spiel that I'm going to say in a little bit <laughs> in my public comment. So I'll save that for this, but I so appreciate all of you who spoke for me tonight and um, I'm speechless. I really am. And that's really hard to be because I can go on and on <laughs> as we've heard, but um, it, I, I will treasure this always. Um, and I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to continue as a community leader, as a community leader that supports equity and supports all students being able to achieve and go forward in their careers, whether it be college or career ready. And that whatever I can do on the other side, I will continue to do and fight for. So um, I appreciate, um, and I will speak to all of you individually. I'd like to go back and contact all of you for saying what you said. But I don't want to take up the meeting, but you're all amazing. And thank you. I just, it's been a privilege. Thank you. That concludes my superintendent's report. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Dr. Reed, I wish I was there and could give you a, 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 a personal hug that I'll have to wait, but, uh, but I would like to just say a, a minute or less and, and offer the chance for the board to do is the same. And I just wanna say one word and that's passion. Uh, Mr. Velasco was the first to say it, but so many of the speakers conveyed that tonight. You have such passion for education and what you believe in. I saw that day in and day out. And I just wanna thank you. I admire that in you and it's unfailing and I know it's going to continue. So thank you for your passion for our schools and our students. Would any other board members like to weigh in here before we move on? Ms. Ford. Yes, uh, I wish I could see you, Jackie. It's sort of hard for us to see you, but I know our paths are cro will cross again. So for my sister board member, I just want to also express simply my gratitude for your service. I am also though very grateful for your passion, your wisdom, your caring, grace, and the thought that you brought to this board. I've also loved that you are unabashedly enthusiastic about your passions to Ms. Cap's point, which has meant so, so much to so many people in our community, specifically, as has been said about equity, accountability, transparency, and above all, caring for, valuing, and supporting our students. Your recent request to add a student member to the school board is only the most recent example of this. I think you're a loyal friend and a colleague. And, and what I love is that you're not a, afraid to express your loyalty and support to colleagues, to district staff, and to our school community. I also just want to say that I appreciate how you could laugh at yourself and at the many interesting situations that we have faced as a board with a good sense of humor and a really great laugh, which you definitely need in this work. So again, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. I'm looking to see if I imagine Ms. Sims Moten would like to speak. There I see ya. Um, there's been so many um, wonderful words ex you know, expressed throughout this dedication and appreciation for your work. But I, I just wanna go a step further and just to say that we started this journey, uh, again, determined and committed to making sure students were seen and heard and felt uh, included uh, in their education and were engaged in that. And we've seen that throughout the actions and, and, 
and motions that you've brought forth in terms of that. And um, uh, I'm using not for a lack of words, but I'm just, just absolutely emotional. And just even at this point, we met, didn't know each other, but through this have developed a wonderful friendship that I know that will go way beyond this piece and will be there, continue to do that. And I just do want to express your passion and, and, and your heart. If all things were said today is you have a heart, a, a huge and large heart that's open and always ready to include and be there. And we've had many, many laughs and I will miss what I call my pet name for her doctor dissertation because she could <laughs> never just make a short statement it had to be long. So <laughs> that we just, I just appreciate just the laughs that we had and the, and the courage that we had to, you know, face through some of the difficult times that you were there. Uh, and so the things that you have started here really lays the foundation uh, for what we need to know. And this truly is a sisterhood and I couldn't ask for a better sister to get through some things and we'll, remain, we'll be community sisters as well. So thank you so much for all the work that you, that you have done. I know that you will continue to do. And again, thank you so much for your huge heart and commitment for, to include everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simmons Martin. Ms. Munoz? Yes, I'd like to start with a quote um, from Dolores Huerta. People would say, who is a leader? A leader is a person that does the work. It's very simple. It's a personal choice for people who choose to put in their time and their commitment to do the work. It's a per personal choice. I know from the first time that I met Dr. Reed, I was nervous before our meeting for coffee when I was a prospective board member. And as soon as I met you, you were genuine. And we, you shared the passion that you had for our students, for our families. And even though you were honest about how difficult it could be, um, we, I knew that there was hope there and that I knew that you would be a partner and that I would learn from you. So I appreciate your insight, your leadership, your dedication. And as I've shared with you, um, I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you for our students and our families and our community. Um, so it's not goodbye, it's let's go ahead and let's see what's ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Rose and Ms. Munoz. Thanks to everybody for the wonderful sentiments. I'm going to um, move us forward. Uh, Dr. Reed, as you, as you know, we gotta keep moving here, but um, I just, just am profoundly grateful that we had this time. I wish again, we could all be together. So with that, I'm going to move us uh, very mindful that we have a time certain uh, COVID update, but I do wanna get to public comment. We have one uh, person who uh, couldn't speak last meeting because it went too late uh, in terms of public comment. So we are going to go to our public comment um, for non-agenda items and board. We will zoom back to uh, board correspondence if there's anything further you'd like to say after we get to the COVID report so that we can keep keep to our schedule as best as possible. So Mr. Hio, if you could uh, welcome our public speaker. Yes, good evening, President Capps, members of the board. We have one uh, public comment, Ms. Alma Flores. Alma, can you hear us? I, I, I can hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, before I begin, I wanna thank Ms. Reed, thank you so much for your dedication um, to all of our families, especially to our Latino families, and, and I wish you the very best. Um, my public comment is going to be made in Spanish. Uh, mi nombre es Alma Flores, y estoy aquí representando a PFLAG Santa Barbara, que es una organización nacional sin fines de lucro, y la misión principal de, de PFLAG es dar apoyo e información a familiares amigos, aliados de personas LGBTQ. Eh, mi hijo más joven se, se identifica como una persona LGBTQ. Utiliza el, el género no binario. Cuando me lo contó, eh, supe inmediatamente que iba a necesitar mucha información para, para poder darle el apoyo que iba a necesitar. Eh, y empecé a buscar, no había mucho eh, en, en cuanto a información en español pero encontré a PFLAG, eh, todas sus reuniones eran en inglés, eh, que puedo hablar el idioma, pero, pero no es mi, mi idioma de corazón, no es mi idioma de, 
de, natal. Entonces, este, creamos Key Flag en español. Eh, esta va a ser nuestra cuarta junta virtual, eh, totalmente en español, con interpretación al inglés simultáneo. Y nos reunimos el segundo jueves de cada mes. La siguiente junta será eh, este jueves que viene, 12 de noviembre, a las 7 de la noche. Y vamos a tener un invitado de, P de, um, de Pride, Pacific Pride Foundation. Y él, ella nos va a hablar sobre la diferencia entre la orientación sexual y este, la identidad de género. Eh, estos temas, como ustedes lo sabrán, son temas tabús que no se hablan. Eh, se vio muy claramente ahora con lo del currículo de Teen Talk. Eh, muchas familias con mala información, eh, desinformación, y, y se están dejando manipular por, por gente que, que, que les está dando información incorrecta. Entonces, es, ahora, es, ahora más que nunca es muy importante tener esto, estos espacios en español, eh, son espacios seguros, confidenciales, y pueden ser anónimos también. Entonces, eh, si por favor pueden compartir esta información con sus conocidos, con agencias. Eh, la próxima reunión, como les dije, es el jueves um, 12 de noviembre a las 7 de la noche. Y este, pueden ir a PFLAG Santa Bárbara en español y allí encontrarán el enlace para registrarse. Gracias. Thank you. And President Capps, that concludes public comment. Thank you to our speaker. Thanks, Ms. Trujillo. Uh, so now we're going to um, skip ahead in the agenda to our time certain um, item H1. And rest assured, we'll be going back to the other items. But we do want to get to our COVID report. Almost on time here, just five minutes late. So thanks to everyone for that. And I turn it over to Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you once again uh, for President Caps and board members. We have uh, several items in addition to COVID that we want to update the board on. Last meeting, you asked for a report um, on our preschool models, and we even have some updates on food, transportation, and others that are part of today's report. So with that, we'll start with our first slide. As you know, we, keep, we continue to be guided by the county uh, health department and the rates of transmission. We continue to look at all of our preparedness uh, for facility staffing. We have completed our family choice for in-person or distance learning. You'll hear a little bit more uh, data on that in, our, in a couple of slides. And in our next slide, you'll notice that, or you'll, I'd like to remind you in the public, next slide, Mr. Rouse, please, that um, never in the, never before have we had to open schools in, in conjunction with another public agency like uh, the CDC, the California Public Health Department, our county health department, which informs a lot of our policies and practices as we continue to look at all of the ways that we are organized to ensure that we serve students well. So just wanted to make sure that we are constantly reminded that those are some of the things we take into consideration as we make our many decisions. With that, I'd like to now introduce Ms. Daisy uh, Ochoa to tell us a little bit more about our preschool programs. Daisy, are you with us? Yes, uh, good evening. Um, uh, I am here just to give you another update of our preschool reopening plan. Um, I am excited to share with you that when we reopen along with the rest of our school district, we will come back um, on a four day in person schedule, keeping Wednesday as um, our distance learning day to align with the rest of our um, colleagues. Um, we have been serving our um, parents um, having them select uh, which option they would like, whether they want to come back into our in-person model or they have also the option to stay in a distance learning model. Um, we have been serving in person our moderate to severe um, special ed students in small cohorts. And by the end of this month, we actually will be starting um, or adding more small cohorts. Um, about 60 more preschool students will be um, uh, welcoming back into our uh, preschool classrooms across all of our school sites. So our teachers have been working hard and are really excited um, for those um, small cohorts to begin. Uh, next slide. Those are actually pictures from our current um, 
as special ed classrooms um, right now. Um, and so I know at the last board meeting, you got to see a day in the life of our kindergarten students, um, our junior high and high school. So here's what a day in the life of our preschool students or most little ones in um, our district. And so this is um, what it would be like in, in person and then our distance learning model as well. So um, when we come back in January, this would be um, what it would look like. Of course, it will vary from site to site and, and you know, with, um, um, it could obviously change depending on um, the day, but for the most part, this would be our schedule. Um, you know, we're having staggered, staggered times, just like the rest of our sites with our circle time, some outdoor exploration and um, some small groups student-centered exploration, our closing circle, and um, some lunch, and then pick up time. And then our distance learning model, we will just be continuing what our students actually are doing now. This is our um, somewhat our, of our schedule that we have currently for, um, for our distance learning um, schedule. Um, so we have um, really um, stress the personal care routines and more routines at home, and we have um, uh, three learning blocks at home, two of those being um, Zooms with teachers, a, a general circle time with a larger group. And then later on, we break into um, uh, smaller groups and breakout sessions. And then we always encourage, um, you know, outdoor play, um, you know, play is, is, is really important in uh, this, um, in this age group. So we encourage um, some um, outdoor exploration. And then of course, we also um, have some asynchronous um, time. We are utilizing Seesaw um, as well as uh, along with our, you know, TK and K teachers, uh, our teachers and parents are loving the Seesaw um, app that we're using. Um, a couple of our, um, uh, of our classrooms have up to over a thousand um, uh, uh, of, of responses of in so that there's a lot of parent engagement happening with our seesaw um, uh, uh, application so we're really excited to continue to use that even when we come back to in person so that's just a little glimpse of what preschool will look like when we come back in january thank you daisy next we have uh, matt Dittman to give us an update on our food service and some changes matt, good evening you? oh good evening thank you very much um, like you saw in uh, Daisy's slides, uh, food services will be accommodating both models um, in person and distance learning. When we switch into hybrid, uh, we'll be able to do both uh, thanks to the emergency feeding uh, program that will still be going on. There are some changes, however. Um, there is now a, a meal maximum per vehicle um, as per uh, state and federal rules. Um, if you do have more then five, please give us a call at Food Services uh, at either of those extensions, 6385 or 6279, and we can try and make special arrange arrangements. Uh, we have also, due to daylight savings, uh, saving time, we have uh, modified the supper service to uh, three to five, so it's about an hour earlier. Um, uh, I hope that's gonna be uh, uh, accommodating for everyone in their work schedules. Uh, next slide, too. Um, we have some exciting news. We have uh, two new partnerships. The first one is with the food bank, and we're starting that this week. Um, and, it, and families can pick up boxes, uh, 40, uh, up to 40 pound boxes of, of food supplied by the food bank. Um, they do require family names and uh, a little bit of family information, but you can pick up those boxes at Franklin Elementary, uh, Elementary or McKinley. Uh, Fridays 1130 to 1 and another exciting partnership we have is with <clears throat> excuse me Family Service Agency FSA and UCSB. Uh, this one started last week and um, uh, they're they're really amazing prepared meals uh, that you can pick up for completely for free uh, and they're meant for families of four. Uh, there's no age requirements there's no name or anything you can just pick them up it's while supplies last they do go pretty fast. So we have three different sites for that. That's available on Wednesdays at La Cuesta from 7.30 a.m. till 9 a.m. And also uh, at Santa Barbara High on Thursdays and Harding Elementary on Fridays, 11.30 to 1. Uh, really hope everyone is able to uh, take advantage of these partnerships while they last. Um, they're really, really uh, uh, great offerings for our families. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and then lastly, for food services, um, we are open for the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, so I please hope, or I hope that uh, our families take advantage of that as well. We'll be providing our grab and go breakfast and lunches uh, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. That's November 23rd, 24th, and 25th. That's 11.30 to one, and it's at four locations, um, Dos Pueblos High School, La Colina Junior High, La Cumbra Junior High, and Franklin Elementary. So we're really trying to get the broad spread of our beautiful city. Uh, and please, please, please make sure you take advantage of, of, of the food services uh, department during that week. Um, and that is all for food services. Thank you, Mr. Dimon, and, and thank you to your staff as well. We wanna recognize how hard they have been working and we are very grateful to you and the team for all the work that you do. And now Ms. Jate. Thank you, Superintendent Maldonado. So our secondary and elementary bus services will start on January 19th. This includes for the secondary, the booster um, um, routes that they have to accommodate the children. Face masks will be re required. And at this time, all routes remain the same as last year. Um, and now for Ms. Susan Klein Rothschild. You need to unmute. <laughs> Thank you for having me again to talk about COVID. Um, this, I'm gonna share a couple charts today and some additional information. This chart shows our case rate, the number of COVID cases we have in our community in Santa Barbara County. We want this to be low. The lower it is, the safer it is for all of us and the lower the risk of transmission. You notice that it was very low in the spring. In July, we had a real peak and it was not a safe place, time to be out because there were so many cases in our community. On the right-hand side of the chart, you'll see it's going down. It's gone down from the red tier really close to the orange tier. We are bouncing a little bit here and I'm really concerned. I wanna be honest with you that the number of COVID cases is increasing dramatically. It's dr increasing in the entire country. It's in increasing California, and it's increasing in Santa Barbara and our neighboring counties, San Luis Obispo and Ventura County. We need to do something to change this. We keep this case rate down. When the cases are low numbers, we are all safer and less risk of transmission. So it's something we wanna talk about and work on diligently. Next slide, please. This is a slide that kind of shows how this works. Think of this as Swiss cheese. On the left-hand side, there are cloth masks. Cloth masks are a good barrier to transmission. They stop a lot of the, the virus pieces that come through. Some of them get through in Swiss cheese. So then we've got social distancing, physical distancing, and we've got cleaning and disinfecting and hand washing. And by having all of these different types of barriers together they form the low transmission that we want to see so we are all dependent on doing all of these things to keep our transmission rates low next slide please there is a brand new dashboard that's put forward by santa barbara county and these are a couple of the views that you can see um, there's a lot of information and it's much easier to see than, than we've seen in other data slides. So this shows us what is our case rate? That is how many COVID cases do we have in our county? And on the right, what's the test positivity rate? That is if everybody who gets tested, what percentage of those are positive? Those are the things we watch closely. Those two things are what determine what our tier is. We are in the red or substantial tier, and we've been there since the end of September. I want to be honest and say that the last week and a half, our numbers have been going up. In particular, we know that there have been some parties with these, and no masks, no physical distance, and we have had a number of new cases on a daily basis. And so I would not be surprised if our numbers are going up in the next couple of weeks. And that is not good for schools and that is not good for our community. So these are things we wanna watch regularly and monitor and we wanna all do our part to help keep this case rate down. One of the things we've talked about doing is bringing together youth leaders. 
leaders at high schools, some of whom have spoke to this board, help us, help us think about what else we can do to help our fellow students do these things. Because if we don't take those actions about wearing face coverings, physical distance, hand washing, those things I spoke about earlier, it will not be safe to be in the community. And that is not a good thing. And we're coming up on holidays. And I know people want to be with family. And I know people want to travel. I want us to think about the impacts of those decisions we make. So next slide. This is another part of the new dashboard. On the left-hand side, it says daily cases by episode date. Episode date means the earliest time we knew someone was COVID positive. So it could be the date when they had their specimen taken for the test, or it could be someone interviewed them and said, no, I had symptoms two days before that. So this is the earliest date we know when they had a positive COVID. And we're monitoring that very closely. This chart shows us the federal correctional complex, so that impacts our numbers also, uh, but that's important to watch. And the right-hand side, the chart shows us transmission. I need to say, a lot of times we don't know how people get infected with COVID. They don't know. It could be in the community. It could be part of their family. It could be part of gatherings. So we don't have a lot of clear information about this, but as much as we know from interviewing people, that's reflected in this chart. I share with you that sbc-dashboard.org has a lot of new information and I urge you to look at it. For, for guidance on knowing what's going on in our community. And I also ask everyone listening, we need your help. We need your help to follow this guidance so we can all be safer and our students can be safer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Suzanne. And thanks for all your great partnership and constantly being there for us. Now, um, I will take this one, Mr. Rouse. I, uh, we're gonna look at uh, the Re-entry timeline, as you can see here, we have completed our first two actions. Uh, the, by the end of this week, our parents will be receiving a letter verifying their program selection, and we will accept modifications to their selections uh, during these two days. So that starting the following week, our staff can begin to put together our schedules and our groups so that our parents can have their students scheduled for the next second semester by the December 14th and 18th uh, week. Uh, next, we'd like to have Mr. Rouse go over some of the data with parent selection of programs for you to view. Mr. Rouse. All right, as uh, Superintendent Maldonado mentioned, we've uh, surveyed our families last week and then followed up with families yesterday and today, our schools and uh, district staff have been making phone calls uh, to those families who did not respond last week to our digital survey. We've reached a 94% response rate overall on our survey, which is excellent. Um, overall, we're seeing that about a quarter of our uh, families or students are uh, uh, having the distance learning option selected, and 75% are selecting the in-person hybrid model. And you can see the breakdown here among our different levels of school. We also uh, measured the same breakdown looking at socioeconomic status, which is represented SED on this slide. And you see that we have for our non-SED students, 20% uh, selecting distance only versus 80% in person. And for SED students, 30% distance only and 70% in person hybrid. We, on the next slide, we also um, did a, a sub, another breakdown of uh, preferences for A days or B days. Just as a reminder, we asked families to uh, indicate if they did have a preference. There was no requirement to, uh, to express a preference. And in fact, we asked families on that form to verify that they understood that it was just a preference and that it was not guaranteed if they did uh, make a selection. So this will factor into, as we try and create um, school schedules that are balanced between group A, Monday, Tuesday, in-person days, and group B, Tuesday, Friday, in-person days, you know, balancing to make sure that, that those are even. On the whole, if you uh, take group A um, on one side and group uh, B with those who express no preference, there is an opportunity to, to balance if you imagine those who picked no preference flowing into group B. So we, um, 
will be looking at how to best balance those over the coming weeks and uh, schools will be making adjustments as needed to make sure the cohorts or uh, groups, excuse me, are as balanced as possible. All right, moving on, uh, Dr. Becky will be sharing an update on hiring data. Thank you very much. Good evening, board members. And I wanted to bring you two slides tonight that give you an update in the HR realm. Uh, one is on our uh, hiring update. I brought this slide to you at our last board meeting. Um, the totals in these columns um, add up to the targets for each of these positions. So um, just to bring you an update uh, tonight, I've, I have some current um, information for you that might even be different than what you have on the slide presentation, but we did offer and get accepted for floater custodians. So that's some good news. We saw movement in that category where we're looking for six. So we still have two more we're looking for there. Um, paraprofessionals, the most current data I have is we have four um, offers out. And so um, that's a little progress. Uh, playground supervisors is at two. And uh, we had some substantial movement in the area of hiring hybrid uh, substitute teachers. So I think last time the data that you saw at our last boarded meeting was 15, and we now have secured 29 of the 40 that we're looking for for our hybrid substitute teachers. Those were the long-term subs, if you remember, not, uh, not just substitutes on our call list, but actually long-term subs that'll be there every day in person. Uh, I can tell you that um, we continue to advertise and um, you know, I, I did get a spot on KEYT last week, and uh, we also instituted a finder's fee program for our, uh, it's an incentive for our employees to refer uh, people to uh, these job openings. And um, if they indeed get hired and work for us, we will um, provide a $100 incentive. We also have uh, the starting, starting hourly rate of these are um, competitive with our neighboring districts. So that is some good news. If um, you know of anyone that is um, just good people that want to do great work with our kids and help out our community um, in this time of need, please make sure that you have them get in touch with our HR office or go to our website. Our next slide is um, a slide that I wanted to bring you data on what we're seeing in terms of uh, our staff members requesting leaves of absence or um, accommodations um, based on their circumstances. The columns on the left of, the, of each of these three graphs was the estimation that we made uh, based on a survey um, probably a month ago, maybe more than that, of what we thought we would have for requests for accommodations or leaves of absence. So for example, we, we've, we estimated 22 elementary certificated would request leaves of absence. What we got yesterday um, from when the window closed was 23. And that's the column on the right. Um, and then you'll see the secondary certificated there. Um, and then you also see a classified staff um, graph there. Now, what we need to do now with, um, we have the requests that are in. Uh, what the work we need to do now over the next couple weeks is to meet individually. We are obligated by law to meet individually with, with these requests. It's called the interactive process. We um, look at their submitted doctor's notes and then we have to make a determination about um, reasonable accommodations or possible leaves of absences. So we'll work through that process. And then uh, we anticipate that we will be ready around December 11th to um, be able to create schedules and place teachers with kids in, in either distance learning or in person. Um, you may get requests for, you know, from parents or teachers wanting to know, you know, is my, is my kid's teacher gonna work distance or not? And I just need you to know that we, we have to work through that legal process and make those determinations through that process before we can uh, make any placements of teachers. So with that, I will go ahead and pass it on to Dr. Wagenek, I believe is next. And um, uh, Dr. Wagenek, it's, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the most frequent questions that we've received in the last month or so is, well, wh what will you do if there is a positive case of COVID on one of your campuses? What if a, a staff member or student gets 
sick. And um, last, uh, maybe a week ago, Sunday, we had our first case of a, a student who was on campus uh, regularly, uh, almost every day, participating in athletics who did test positive for COVID. Um, we thought it would be a very good exercise to share with the board the process that we went through, let the public um, be aware of our process so that we could answer that um, question very uh, clearly and openly. Um, so we did have um, a student at Santa Barbara High School um, test positive for COVID. Um, that students uh, and the athletic pod that they were uh, involved in uh, is on a 14 day protocol or, or quarantine right now per protocol. So here was the process. I was contacted by Principal Elise Simmons at approximately 11.30 a.m. Um, on Sunday morning. Um, the coach had received the information from the parent. The coach notified the athletic director who quickly contacted uh, Principal Simmons. Uh, she contacted me. Um, and while um, she was communicating with the family and gathering more information, um, I referred to the Santa Barbara County Health Protocol that was provided to us by Susan Fine Rothschild and advised Superintendent Maldonado on next steps. Uh, we, we conferred and it was decided um, that based on that protocol given to us by County Public Health, that that cohort would be closed. Um, I communicated that to Dr. Simmons and she and um, Assistant Principal uh, Dan DuPont immediately set about notifying the families um, of the students who were in that athletic pod. Um, they were notified by phone. And when they were notified by phone, they were also told that they would be uh, receiving an uh, official letter via email. And that is a letter that was provided to us by County of Public Health. Um, I was able to communicate with Susan um, that afternoon, uh, let her know what steps we had taken, calibrate with her, and um, we were um, not surprised, but pleased to hear that we had um, followed the guidelines very well and done exactly as was intended by public health. Um, it was also decided um, that you know, communication was optional and this was an area where we needed to definitely communicate with the families of the students in the pod, but we also needed to consider who else we needed to communicate with. Of course, um, board, you know that we did uh, communicate with you early on in the process to let you know what steps we were taking. Then Dr. Simmons um, did communicate to Santa Barbara High School families but um, Ms. Maldonado also communicated out to district families. Um, folks have, some folks have asked, what, why did you send an email out to the entire district um, when it was a, a Santa Barbara High School uh, event? Well, if you're like me and you lived here for a long time, um, you know that we in Santa Barbara and in the South Coast community have um, the benefits of a metropolitan area, but we are at our core, a, a small town. And so information does spread very quickly. And we wanted to make sure that during this first case of, of a student testing positive, that all of our families had information and knew the steps that we had taken, because we, um, we are committed to educating, and communicating clearly with everyone. That will not be the case moving forward. Um, we will take each case on an individual uh, basis and decide um, what the communication should be for that case. So uh, to close, I, I just wanna share some takeaways um, um, in our after action debriefing. This is really what we came up with, uh, it, the system works. 
and it worked in this case. And um, we've been able to move forward and um, the student is, is healing and the, the pod will be out of quarantine in a couple of days. Um, families for the most part um, were receptive to the communication and appreciated it. And, and um, the swiftness, you can see that the entire process, there were a lot of decisions and actions that had to take place. And, and in about five and a half hours, we were able to um, take care of those actions, but families were receptive. We did see the need to build a dashboard as a way of um, communicating out information going forward so that anyone who's interested can track uh, the progress um, and, and really see the number of cases um, that we are dealing with. And, and again, do that very clearly and openly with our community. Um, and then finally, um, because one coach uh, staff member did uh, was um, in that athletic pod, uh, we saw that we needed to clarify a system for response testing for staff. And Dr. Becchio um, has been working on clarifying that both with public health and with um, uh, other providers. So, um, that is what folks can expect from us. And um, at this point, I will now turn it back over to Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you so much, Dr. Raganek and board members. As you can see, we are getting uh, tighter and tighter with all our protocols and our communication. I do wanna just uh, take some time to recognize that we also had a chance to participate in a couple of town halls last week with County Public Health. Uh, we had a couple of doctors with us, Dr. Dodds, Dr. Uh, Dorinoso, uh, Mrs. Batson, I believe, Susan will help me with the name, and Susan klein Rothschild. We had over 200 participants combined. There was a lot of questions that still continue to come up around, you know, how we're going to enforce mask wearing, questions around transportation, which is why we brought some of that information to you today. Lots of concerns around a student's mental health continue to pop up. And of course, our sanitation and cleaning protocols and just how we're going to make decisions, which you've heard a little bit through this last uh, part with our protocols where we do have a case. We're also continuing our school visits where we have um, for a president of uh, Santa Barbara Teachers Association, Karen McBride, Steve Vizzolini, myself, several of our assistant superintendents have joined me for those visits, other directors and uh, we meet teachers at school in the morning and we have a chance to have a teacher-led meeting where they get to tell us what they're concerned about, what, what questions they have about how we're going to do this. I've had a chance to go to Cleveland, Santa Barbara High School, Goleta Valley, La Colina Monroe, and Santa Barbara Community Academy. And I, I have to say that I'm very impressed and proud of our teachers and the the way they continue to uh, challenge themselves, but also challenge us to do better by everyone so that uh, when we get to our opening in January, we are well prepared to open um, our safe schools. With that, um, we also have some updates on our communication tools. So Ms. Cami Barnwell will go next. Thank you. Uh, real briefly, I wanted to remind our families and maybe even people in the community, members of the media that haven't had the chance to check out our new web page that's devoted to all the things you, all the questions that people have been asking about. We have a frequently asked questions page. We have, um, you can see it here, there's four different main sections. We've got it organized around health and safety protocols, uh, the schedules that students will be uh, having if they choose distance learning versus hybrid, um, and just the process that parents are going through right now in terms of confirming that choice. And that frequently asked ask questions page is the one that I really want to try to draw people's attention to. We've been updating it as we go. Uh, it started with like 29 questions. There's 34 because people just have a lot of questions with each with each day, with each week, where um, people are becoming educated about certain things, and then new things will come up. So. Uh, keep your questions coming, and um, everyone knows how to reach me. I believe I'm Cami Barnwell, C Barnwell at sbunified.org. If you have questions, let me know. Thanks so much. Back to you, Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you. And lastly, I want to close this report with 
taking some time, we did a little bit of a survey of our staff in Santa Barbara Unified, and it turns out we have many uh, employees whose names you'll see here and where they belong who have served in our armed forces. We want to take a moment to thank them. Tomorrow is a holiday and we get to be free and we get to be here today thanks to all the sacrifices that they chose to make in their life and we want to thank them for their service. So thank you board president, board members. That's our report for today. Thank you for that excellent report and especially the tribute to our veterans uh, educators. So, uh, you know, we don't have any public speakers on this. So this means we can dive right into board questions and comments. Um, I have a couple myself that I'd like to lead with. Uh, Dr. Becchio, um, you're back on tap here because I do, I remain concerned about the hiring. I appreciate the transparency of, of the challenges, but I just wanna, if you could um, speak to uh, the finder's fee and ways in which that fee is getting communicated, any other entrepreneurial type of ideas that are being batted around. Because again, I just think this is first and foremost uh, crucial that we hire. Um, and I would love to hear more thoughts about uh, those efforts to recruit. And good news about the four that just accepted today for uh, custodians. Yeah, that is um, that is good news because um, the panel. I think we had uh, five candidates uh, for that, so we were able to make offers to four people. So yes, the um, just to speak to the incentive for a finder's fee. Um, that's that's just a way for staff. Um, we we did put that out to all staff, and um, we are actually getting um, we are getting quite a bit of action of action in that space. Um, in fact, I have seen it posted on, on people's social media to um, employees to try to capture uh, different references and, and get them in here to apply. So that's good. Uh, we also did an analysis of the actual starting hourly salary and, and um, we did that early in the week and, and now have the starting salaries or they're actually hourly um, at a rate that is very competitive. Uh, so that was another, another thing that we did. Um, and like I said, we also, um, I mentioned to you last time, we have these posted in um, different places, some of which we don't normally do postings, um, but we also, uh, we also had um, the KEYT spot, so that was helpful. Um, we'll see if uh, now that the election's over, if we can get some more time in that space. Uh, maybe a little bit longer story on, on what our community needs are with respect to uh, hiring and having people in the schools. Um, the other, um, I'll just mention one other item that um, is of interest. We do have, um, this, is, this is in terms of just providing coverage for sites. And um, one other idea that, that I'm exploring is the idea of hourlies, um, hourly workers. And we do have a bunch of people connected to school communities that do volunteer um, and or parents that may be available and we may be able to also um, get those individuals signed up as hourly employees as well. So I know that's not, um, it, you know, in the, in the attempt to hire these positions, I'm also looking at alternatives to if we don't reach the target, say of 20 para educators in the general ed, I also want other ideas of how to um, fill those those gaps that we may need during uh, when we get into hybrid. So I hope that uh, gives you a little bit of information. Uh, yeah, it does. And, um, I just, again, just want to reiterate that, that, you know, all creative options, I think, should be on the table because this is, you know, akin to, I mean, this is crisis and to attract people to come in and, and work in our schools, it's a wonderfully rewarding job. but. Um, but we, just, you know, I'm, I'm all in support of, of the incentives, even financial that you're providing. So thanks for those. Um, I do want, uh, if you could pull up the chart, uh, Mr. Rouse, of um, those teachers who, or, and other classified staff who have requested leaves, if, if um, Dr. Becky, if you could just put those in context for the public. I have a sense of it, but uh, just out of how many, because I don't, I don't, I want people to have the, the right assessment of, 
you know, is, is 17 classified staff. We had anticipated 82, 17 out of how many? Oh, sure. I can do that for you. Um, so we have about, it can be rough. Yeah, sure. We have about 750 um, classified staff. We have about 800 certificated staff that are non-management. So uh, those are the, those are the overall numbers. It's, it's actually a very small number of of staff compared to our overall numbers in those categories. But um, remember that these are not necessarily requests for a leave of absence. Um, these are actually, all of them are actually coming in as requests for some kind of an accommodation as we go back to in-person learning. And um, if we are obligated um, to go through a process and, and determine whether we can make a reasonable accommodation with somebody and if we are not then they either continue working their regular schedule or they would need to exercise the option of taking a leave of absence okay so i hope that clarifies none of these are we we actually have had a couple requests for leaves of ab absences outright leaves of ab absences but these are actually um more requests for accommodations thank you for that clarification and would this also does not encapsulate those teachers who prefer to teach distance. The, um, we have teachers that are not in these numbers that may prefer to teach in distance learning, but um, we are asking all employees to come back to in-person work. So they will, they will do that. These are individuals who um, have either a medical condition that we need to work through a process to determine what the appropriate course is for them, or they may have, um, they are living with a spouse who has um, some kind of condition that puts them uh, at high risk. Sure. And um, so we need to work through that as well with those. But those are the only two types of cases that we're getting here. Yeah, okay. can I just jump in uh, really quick for that question, uh, Ms. Caps? Uh, it's, it, we won't be able to grant requests where it's a preference for a teacher. Contractually, they're going to be assigned um, as appropriate with HR and principals. So in this space, it's not like the parent choices. It's not a preference. I understand. Uh, and I, um, along the lines of teachers, that's my concern this evening, um, and, and staff and the hiring process, um, I know that so much, so many efforts have gone in to communicate, and it's it's a field I'm familiar with. It's it's especially in a crisis, you can't you can barely scratch the surface uh, to match the levels of interest and anxiety and curiosity. But I did receive a list of about I don't know 20 questions um, from a group of teachers at a, a junior high today, which revealed to me that you know many of the of the answers were you know are in that uh, frequently asked question document, which I think is superb. And the fact, Ms. Barnwell, that you are actually personally answering questions and and adding those to the FAQ is excellent. And I just applaud that and want to you know support it any way that I can. But it revealed to me, and I shared it with you all, uh, shared it with the um, superintendent and her team beforehand that you know teachers there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of questions. So for example, one of the questions in this long list of uh, questions that I received today, and maybe perhaps other board members received it too, was what happens if you don't hire, <laughs> if we don't reach these goals? And of course we wanna have a can-do attitude that we are going to, but I, you can tell the sentiment behind the question is that this will then fall on teachers potentially, these uh, custodial duties of of cleaning or whatever it might be. So if you could speak to contingency plans um, and then second, second part of the question is really the communication to teachers and are there ideas um, to improve the same way that you had a town hall that I participated in with parents and families? Um, are there any upcoming information sessions? I know it's probably happening school by school but I would just love to end my line of questioning on the, that thought because it really struck me that most of the questions asked by this group of teachers were ones that um, you know we've discussed here, but it, we can't expect that every teacher is going to be <laughs> tuning into our board meetings. And how can we ease and answer questions as best as possible as as situations unfold? So, two part question, uh, yeah. Dr. Bakio, first to you. 
Yeah, maybe I could take the first part of that, which is contingency plans. And um, it's a great question. And yes, we, even if we hit our targets, of all those targets I put there, um, we have to have uh, contingency plans for coverage because we could have a school on any given day that that has um, more people out than they than than they have coverage they have coverage for. So, what we um, deployed today to principals in our meeting was um, a uh, I mentioned it to you last time uh, a tiered coverage plan for each site. So they will be developing these different tiers of contingency plans for when they have one person out and don't have coverage for it, and when they maybe have 10 or 15 people out. And um, this is going to be an all-hands-on-deck approach. So we are going to have tiers where we have, um, you know, for example, I might be assigned to several different schools on a list of a tier where I am going to deploy there and, and basically be where they need me to be on any given day and I have to kind of drop the work that I'm doing here at the district. And so um, we'll, have, we'll have different tiers where different district employees are on lists so that we can deploy and cover sites. So that's a contingency in the area of, of just site coverage and supervision and, and being in classrooms as, for instructional support. As far as the, um, the cleaning and sanitizing, we are not going to be having uh, uh, teachers or class, other classified staff do the sanitizing because that requires some training. Um, teachers and, and classified staff will be doing, um, you know, regular cleaning of surfaces and things like that in between classes. Um, so as far as contingencies for that, I, I um, you know, I think that I, I can maybe turn it to Meg, but I think that department uh, facilities is going to need to look at um, at hiring a company that would be able to come in on any given day if we have a sh if we're short staffed in the custodial space. Uh, thank you for that. I like that approach of, of staff being utilized in different ways as needed. So pre appreciate that explanation. Mm -hmm. Anything else on the in response to my question about communication with teachers and staff that anyone wants to take? Well, I just want to say that I've been sending a weekly update to all staff. Um, I believe the board has been copied where we do share with sure. staff all the different uh, ways that we are planning. Uh, it comes out of my office every Friday. So I'd encourage any teachers who are listening to make sure that they refer to that email. I know that we get a lot of email. We um, also have our principals online tonight that are listening that will also uh, be responding to some of these questions. Uh, there are staff meetings that are continuing to happen. We know that there are PLC meetings coming up where we have, uh, we are narrowing our agendas and our topics that we discuss with our principals from the district office to principals and expect the same from principals to teachers so that this is the number one topic that we will be discussing and planning around in every single school site uh, group of teachers that, that has questions that ask them to please always start with their principal if their principal is not uh, giving them uh, the answers that they need, they can go to the assistant superintendent, whether it's Ms. Ana Escobedo or Ms. Sean Carey. And after that, it would be myself. So you have plenty of us here to support you teachers and we would encourage you to please come to us first so that we can answer all your questions. Thanks for that. And again, just that, that, that FAQ document, I encourage anybody who is, is uh, attending this meeting tonight to check it out because it's, again, just continues to get even more robust in its, its information. And also to Dr. Wagnick, thank you for walking us through that response uh, to the student who has COVID. And we certainly hope that student is feeling okay and those in that pod, uh, I know it must be a scary time. So thank you all around. And I'll now turn it over to my board members if anyone wants to speak, perhaps anyone who has a question kind of on the hiring teacher front or, or not. Dr. Reed, why don't we start with you? Thank you. I did want to um, follow up on that. And I, first of all, I want to acknowledge um, the work that you've done, Dr. Becchio, to sort of frame this for us. And also um, hearing what Ms. Capps said, and I think I brought it up too in the last meeting, is the urgency to ensure that we do have coverage. And so one of the thoughts that I had is, um, and just in terms of thinking outside the box with your contingency plan, have you considered 
reaching out to teacher ed programs where students are have maybe achieved a certain amount of credential credit that they might be in a position to to take this on um because we do have you know locally UCSB we have Westmont we have Antioch anyway I don't know if that's a, an avenue that you've looked into and then in terms of planning um training are there parents that would be willing to engage in the um, during the lunchtime. I know that when we did some site visits, that um, there's going to be a need for more people hands on deck during lunch time, at least in some of the campuses that I was involved in the site visit. So I don't know if there's a backup sort of training plan that could be utilized that could be in place. And also from what Ms. Cap said, the idea of utilizing an admin staff. Um, so I like your idea of a tiered plan, but I don't know if any of those ideas have been considered or if they're even uh, warranted. Yes, they are. Thanks for that question. So we we do actually, the, the student teachers that we have on our campuses also um, can be on our sub list and they do actually um, do those sub roles. So as they enter back into our schools, they'll be um, partners with us in filling some of these gaps and, um, and getting the experience that they need as well at the same time. So that's in the works. Um, and then as far as parents, uh, well, let me take the training question. So um, we are developing um, a, a training protocol for these positions that will land in for hybrid. They will have to be um, pretty quick and, and uh, quick training sessions, possibly online modules, and so that those, those teachers can be prepared. So we're starting that process. And as far as parents, you know, like I said, the idea around, around having an hourly account to draw from where, a, where a possibly a parent who does come serve hours can either volunteer or possibly be an hourly um, employees so that they they are on call for a school site that might need that extra supervision. So that's one idea that we that we are exploring. Thank you. So with that, how would you? So how are you? Are you considering just generating um, sort of a request out to parents for each of each school site that might be interested in, in participating? Because the process, you know, the, there's a process right for fingerprinting and ensuring that whomever is in that classroom is, you know, able to be in that classroom and, and be successful in that classroom. Sorry, the steps that um, we'll take on that is, is just to determine um, really a, the budget code for that, how many per site that we might be allowable and then, and then what kind of hours per week. And then um, we would, that would be something that principals would really um, be putting people forward to sign up and clear to be hourlies. So we're, we're just, um, we're still making a decision on that. And so that should come in the next couple of days to determine if, if that's a route or an avenue that we want to go. Okay, great. I mean, I just think, you know, like you said, that we have to think outside the box currently and just, you know, and there's opportunities that, that, that might be there for, for other, um, student teachers and such and parents. I also, I if I could also mention too, sorry to interrupt, but um, all along those lines, the, the other option that we have that I haven't mentioned is we have a regular sub list as well. And, um, you know, we have usually a 150 or so subs on that list. And so some of them will not want to come in person, but we still have the option to just do on-call subs. So on any given day, we can put out a sub job and someone can take that job as well. So that's another open avenue. That's above and beyond us already having 40 subs employed each day. So that's a possibility as well. The other thought I just had is the idea of um, faculty, teaching faculty and teacher ed programs that might wanna volunteer their time or participate or have other people that they might know and connections because they're out in the community or they're, they're in, you know, they have connections around, you know, the county and outside the county. You might think about reaching out to to um, faculty. Um, the need that we have here. Um, but 
going forward, I did, I did wanted to speak to the school visits and I wanted to acknowledge how quickly, um, Superintendent Maldonado, that you put that in place for these site visits to really get a sensibility of what is happening in the ground, you know, in the trenches at the school sites. And I wondered if in the experiences that you've gone through, has there been commonalities amongst or a theme of, of challenge that's a current maybe challenge amongst the, the sites or are, does it really differ depending on each site, what those needs are? I think the, the commonalities, as we showed in the slide that came up a little bit in the town hall too, was this idea of enforcing the mask wearing and uh, not at every school, but generally um, people are concerned about uh, students maybe who will refuse to wear their mask and or who come from families where that might be a belief that it's not necessarily important. Um, so we just wanna make sure that we, we are not gonna, uh, we want to make sure that we consistently send a strong message that mask wearing will be mandated. Uh, that would be the only thing. As far as uh, health safety protocols, I think we're getting really good at finding out what each specific area needs and, and different schools have different needs in those. So there's no pattern there for us. Great. Well, thank you for jumping on that. And also just the flow, right, of traffic in the school, just from one class to another, hallways, you know, different, like for example, Santa Barbara Community Academy and uh, La Cumbra students. And there's, you know, there's like different areas that they could cross paths, but how they have to really define those, those pathways. So I think that's been really important to have those conversations to see the transparency of what actually is going to happen when, when you know, we hit the ground running with the hybrid model. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. And I'm also asking all teachers and principals to work on lesson plans at the first week of school so that um, everybody's going to be talking about COVID. We're going to track data in our math class. We're going to look at the way the science behind uh, the virus works in science class. We're going to read about it and write about it in English class. And it's going to be everyone talking about COVID and everyone talking about how we wear our masks, finding out why these this particular mask doesn't work for me and this one does. And it's gonna be all hands on deck so that we are also gonna learn lessons and take the lessons with us for, um, for the beginning of the school year so that everybody uh, is responsible for this. It's not just uh, some, but all. Thank you. I mean, that's, I would just say that's, it's like every school has its own culture. And so each creating their culture within this framework that works for them and really keeping and honing that as an educational process is I think a, a great way to do it as opposed to punitive, but how can we work together as a team and create this culture of mask wearing and, and really six foot distancing and, and such. So thank you. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. I'm looking to other board members, Ms. Ford, I see. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Becchio, a couple questions related to staffing. First of all, does your contingency plan uh, also include the possible redistribution of certain district office staff, such as TSAs? Yes, it does. Um, like I said, we would um, be in more in an all hands on deck mode. So um, each department, for example, would have uh, their employees possibly have to be at a school site. Maybe it's first active screening and then they come back to the district office. Um, or maybe it's um, at any given day, district management would have to be at a school site all day long. So that is part of the contingency, yes. Great. And I also think that the word accommodations is kind of an education word. So I wonder if you could be more specific about what kinds of things teachers are asking for in order to, let's say, feel safe or feel like they can do their job. Well, good question. Mostly in this case, what's, um, what is happening is the request is, is being put in to be in uh, distance learning. And so that, that is the request. What we are obligated to do is go through the, the legal process of an interactive process and determine whether that is a reasonable accommodation that we can make. So right now that is really the only accommodation that, that, that really is, is 
being considered because that's the request. However, um, there could be classified positions where even though the request is for remote work, um, we may come to the conclusion that that's not a reasonable accommodation to make, but there are other reasonable accommodations that we can make. Um, for example, um, more uh, PP&E or, or face shields, or we would take a look at their, their workspace and determine if, if there's a way to make that, um, make that better or more safe. Thanks. I, I was wondering if some teachers were asking for plexiglass and other features like that. No. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wagnett. Um, just one question about the infected student, and I'm sorry if you mentioned it, and I was taking notes. But what's the process for the student to return? Um, and I can, uh, Susan, feel free to correct me if I am uh, if I am incorrect, but. Uh, that student stays out during the 14 day quarantine period. And um, depending on their, uh, where they are with their illness, they would return to school after that once they are well. Susan, May how I add I do? a little bit to that? Yes. <laughs> so for somebody who tests positive to COVID, they must be at a minimum of 10 days their symptoms must be improving and they must have no fever without taking any fever reducing medication. So that's an isolation when someone's COVID positive. When somebody's a close contact, then they're in quarantine and that's an automatic 14 days, regardless of what test results may happen. Because mm -hmm. it could be an incubation period from when they were exposed up to 14 days. So if they have their test on day four, maybe they didn't get infected enough to do it. So a quarantine is 14 days. Isolation for positive case is a minimum of 10 days. Ms. Ford, you, you didn't give me time to get my cheat sheet out. So my cheat sheet has all the answers and it's right here. But um, yes, thank you. And we I will add with that that we have our district nurses, um, our district nurse who serves Santa Barbara High School is checking in with the student and their family and advising that them in conjunction with, with Susan and public health. So thanks for that question, Ms. Ford. Pleasure, thanks. Uh, Mr. Tay, I'm kind of a, I'm one of these people that's a little concerned about buses. And so I was wondering about two things. You didn't mention social distancing on the buses. And I'm wondering if there's some sort of bus cleaning oversight or requirement. Yes, um, for MTD, there is a, so for both of the um, MTD and STA, there are both um, social distancing. With STA, which is Student Transportation of America, they will fit siblings together and we will do every other seat. The kids must wear a mask. They wipe down every seat after children get on. So they'll stop off at bus stop A, the kids get on, the bus driver will wipe down, you know, how kids touch the seats all the way down. They will um, wipe those all down. And then at night, they disinfect their buses. And then again in the morning, they disinfect their buses because they don't know if a mechanic went on or whatever. So they, they disinfect evening and, and um, morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, MTD only does it, only disinfects at night. Um, and then they will pick up the kids and they will not wipe down anything or clean anything until they get back to the depot. Um, they too have social distancing. They normally can fit about 58 people with standing room. Um, they have um, said they're only going to allow 15 on, but this was months ago. And I've been asking them because things have kind of changed um, and they're allowing more on the buses, but I can't get a number out of them as of this moment yet. So uh, Ms. maybe Ms. Susan Klein Rothschild has something to add about the social distancing on the bus. 
but 15, but 15 kids on a um, MTD bus is very um, few children for the, for the amount of um, buses we would need. Thank you, may I just add that the guidance from CDPH about buses doesn't say a specific number of feet. Obviously six feet is desired and they say we're practicable. So yes. well, there's flexibility there and how do we decide that? <coughs> Thank you. Okay, Ms. Ford, was that the uh, end of your questions? Oops, I think we might have lost her. So we'll let her come back and I'll move on to any other board member who might have a comment or question. Ms. Sims Moten. Thank you. I, I first want to, uh, uh, Ms. Ochoa, thank you for the day in the life of the preschoolers. Uh, they're often overlooked. Uh, the question I would ask is how are they faring? How are they doing? Um, I appreciate that. I knew you would probably be asking something. <laughs> um, they're doing great. Uh, I would say out of the 90% of responses that we've received from our families, um, 87 have a responder that they are returning into our in-person program and 13% have decided to stay in distance learning. So they are eager to come back into um, our classrooms and um, um, but we also are ready to serve them in distance learning for those families that want to stay in distance learning. Um, but our teachers have been phenomenal in really serving them in remote, with remote instru instruction and really um, keeping them engaged um, and connecting with them. And um, it's really been great um, connecting with the parents as well. Well, I appreciate that because oftentimes our youngest ones who sometimes are again are in the in the background really are the telltale signs of how, how we're doing as a community. So I really appreciate, uh, you know, giving that feedback to how they're doing and that also tells what's going on in the home or their caretakers. And so I appreciate the fact that they're doing well and probably sometimes better than we as adults. So I appreciate that. Um, but I want to continue to hear back on how they're doing and what we can do to to support that. And if when it's uh, when it makes sense, I'd love to do a site visit as well. Yeah, you're always welcome to. I think I, one thing that I want to maybe note is that um, the small cohorts that we are starting, um, a total of, you know, with the ones that will start by the, um, I'll start running, it will be a total of close to 80 altogether, um, 80 students altogether across all of our um, nine sites. Um, there are actually teacher um, directed, teachers wanting to come back and run small these small cohorts they're they're you know they're they're coming back in groups of about four or five at a time um small groups of four or five at a time and it's really to allow them to have that social experience and um and you know uh, there's some things that you just really can't observe right um remotely and and so teachers really want to make those connections and just start transitioning them into when when they come back in january they are you know ready to ready to go so um these are, you know, teachers that they they themselves are, are just eager to come back and want to have their um, their students in the classrooms, um, at least in a small scale. And parents that are really trusting our teachers um, to do that. So I think that speaks volumes in itself. I really do appreciate it, and thank you for the teachers that are ready to come back and be engaged. So I appreciate that you know, ongoing uh, getting ready for our students. Uh, so Dr. Becky, I have a couple questions uh, that are directed to you. So just a quick question, uh, the, the issues that we're having with regards to hiring, are, are you seeing that across the district, or across the county, in, in other districts as well? Um, I'm not seeing, uh, I'm not actually seeing uh, the job postings that many. So if I look, for example, locally, I'm not seeing um, a, a, for example, paras um, hiring that big of a pool of paras. So that's, I'm just not seeing that. So across other, I mean, do you, you talk to other district human resources that, I mean, are you sharing that information between you, between you, amongst you rather? You um, yes, we have, we have, um, we have a consortium where we are on with the other HR uh, folks in the district and um, or in the county, sorry, and um, 
but mostly we're, our topics have been around our um, negotiations around with our, with our labor partners. Um, and so I anticipate that the next meeting will probably likely be about a lot more about staffing around hybrid because many are opening um, some of the larger districts anyways are going to open after the first of the year and so um, I expect that to be a larger topic but no I have not um, heard too many of them talking about staffing issues. Yeah well, I appreciate that just a general question if, if we're the only one experiencing it or can we then share our share our pain if you will. Um, the next question, just as we continue to think outside the box with regards, perhaps maybe in for custodians or even probably more so with the playground supervisors, have you considered talking to the Department of Social Services in their Cal Works program? Because there are parents that have to go back to work, face with different things. So that might be an option to talk to the Department of Social Services who has a Cal Works program with parents who may, you know, they need work. And so it may be part time, however, but it might be another option uh, for us to look as well. I haven't, but um, but thank you for that suggestion. I just wrote it down in my notes. Okay, and are we then also our list of requests, or is that also with the employment uh, uh, office? Do we have lists there that people, as they're applying for benefits, are our list there for them to look at as an option as they may be able to work part time and still receiving, you know, part time uh, benefits? That we looked at in incorporating that into their process. I. I I don't believe so, but I'll also write that down also and look into that, Sims Mountain. Thank you. So um, lastly, I, I would just say, I, I happen, happen to have to uh, take the bus. I rode the MTD bus and it was interesting because I was all ready to you know, pay my fee, but turns out that you load from the back. You never really have much you know, interaction with the driver. Everybody has their mask on and you're loading from the back. And at this point, I know that you're not paying anything. So, you know, that's interesting. And I think there were really only maybe 15 or 20 people may have been less than that. So they may be looking at, you know, even small uh, number of folks being on the bus at the same time observing, you know, what's practical as, as Susan had, has suggested. So I have experienced that and seeing that, yes, they're trying to, you know, keep that safe. You're really loading from the back. I don't know how, what, how that will, you know, how that happens with students going on. That may be different in terms of that, but I have seen their process in real, Real life. So, Mr. Tay, I don't know if you want to speak. Yeah, to that at all. they did mention that they would load from the rear. Um, the reason why they're not charging is because the number of people they can put on a bus. So they haven't been charging since COVID. But once the boosters start for our schools, I believe that their thought is that they would go back to charging. And uh, of course, our students who qualify or qualify for free or reduced bus passes. Right. Well, I appreciate that. And then lastly, Superintendent Maldonado, I just want to appreciate the fact that you're incorporating what we're going through in COVID in everyday life and how there can be solutions. As you said, I'm incorporating in math, how many masks, how many versus that. So I think that's a really good idea in the day to day, you know, getting students engaged in how that because I think that 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 um, that inspires creativity you know, how things can maybe solve, how we can do, uh, do things differently. And most times students are really engaged in how to, to solve issues, particularly because they're so ready to get back together and they certainly want to be able to do that and maintain this, you know, the idea of getting back together in a larger, you know, much more larger scale. And we know that we can't do that until we safely do everything that we do. So I really appreciate you incorporating it in the daily lesson uh, to that. And I think that's a really good idea to keep everybody involved at the same time. I think that, um, people feel that they can, they understand their role a lot better and how we keep us all safe and how we all get back to ultimately, you know, in full engagement in the classroom. So thank you so much for that. So I appreciate all the work that you continue to do. And I, and I appreciate all of us being responsive through many different avenues as opposed to being reactive. So I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Zvotin. And uh, Ms. Ford is back with us now for a little while. So I just want to let you um, continue your line of thoughts. Line of questioning. <laughs> um, well, that sounds more dramatic than I meant to. It does, sounds very loyally. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have much more, but Ms. Cho, I wanted to ask you, did, um, did you have to hire any additional staff? And it sounds like it was clear that you're not doing a hybrid model. So how many kids are in the class? 
So no, we are not doing a hybrid model. Our, um, right now we are at 12 students per preschool classroom. So therefore we are able to come back um, without having to do a, a hybrid model. So we're, um, we're coming back at that four day a week. Um, so we uh, are not, we are, we're looking into possibly having maybe a couple extra para educators as subs, maybe be like a sub um, pool for, um, uh, you know, in case someone does call out. But what's unique within our preschool program is that we do have an eight to one ratio, um, you know, because of our um, uh, of our licensing and Title V regulations, so we um, we do have some extra staffing that we work, we are able to in case of you know someone being out, we can be able to move staff around from here to there, uh, which is why we um, are able to possibly you know not have to even hire the an extra staff for um, distance learning um, because we'll be able just to utilize the staff that we just already have. So we're, we're able to be a little bit creative, but we still wanna be able to have that constituency plus as you have. And so we, or as, as we all said, so we might um, possibly have a, a sub pool in place um, if needed, but um, you know, we're still trying to plan out that process. Um, you know, we're a little different in a sense where we, we have extra staffing because of our ratios. Um, so uh, I've been conservative and not over um, in, enrolling our students in that sense, in, in our programs and classrooms. Um, so when we did come back for in-person service in ser uh, services, we were able to um, um, be, be able to serve our students and our staff and keep our staff. So. Um, Hopefully it, it's, it serves us <laughs> right. And um, so, so far, um, no, we have not had to hire anybody. Thank you. Um, and this question is for Mr. Rouse. Um, I liked the general uh, data that we received. I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity, maybe not the rest of the board wants to see it, but if anyone could actually disaggregate it further. For example, I'd love to know where the distance learning um, requests are in terms of if there was anything that was outstanding in terms of which schools and um, also like even within elementary school where were the requests for distance learning or is it all across the board very very even because it's one thing to say that there's for example 25 percent requests to stay in distance but there probably it has to be some kind of story deeper inside that data Sure, there is, we do see some variation by individual schools um, when I would look at some initial summary results and we could certainly um, prepare a report disaggregating that data uh, for the board if you'd like. Thanks a lot. Okay, Ms. Munoz, thanks for your patience. Um, yes, I appreciate you know the thoroughness of the report. I know there's quite a few questions that have been answered, so thank you, everyone. Um, I was wanting to know, uh, Mr. Dittman, about the food services. Um, I wondered if there's any trends that you've noticed with, like for example, the lunchtime or or the supper time in particular. You know, um, I pre you know now that the the um, with the daily daylight savings time is there certain things that you're seeing throughout our district? Yes, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, it, in terms of trends, it has been uh, quite consistent uh, for some time now. We're actually approaching uh, 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 nearly a million, million meals served since the start of COVID. Um, uh, our supper has, <laughs> our supper has um, uh, been very consistent as well. Uh, and we did start the AM service, which is, is, is modest in its numbers, but has been also consistent as well. Okay. And, you know, and certainly with, um, with November, you know, the partnership with the, with the food bank um, is great to support, especially our families that have the most need. Um, so thank you for all your efforts. Thank you. That's all. Well, thank you, Ms. Munoz, for ending on that note. Uh, I too also really was lovely to see the, the, creativity and the numbers and the, the fact that there's now 
free meals for anybody at those schools and, and just incredible the kind of outreach. So thank you so much, Mr. Dittman and everybody involved in food services, all the folks who are preparing the meals and serving the meals. Um, so I believe uh, that we, that wraps up our report, Superintendent Maldonado, unless you're seeing a yes, affirmation. Yes, absolutely. And I just, again, uh, thanks all around for a very concise and tight report with a lot of progress to share with the public. Uh, we do have about 115 attendees here to, right now. So thanks to all of you for hanging in there and being part of this with us. So with that, I'm gonna take us back up into the agenda. It's 8.23, we'll have a break in a little bit, but I'd like to um, just take care of the, the sort of beginning part of the agenda, which is um, C, and we haven't yet had a chance for board comments or co correspondence. Um, I know Dr. Reed, you had mentioned that you had something prepared and I just wanna make sure we give you the time for that. So uh, if I could ask you to go first and then any other board members um, who want to share any correspondence uh, beyond our uh, tribute to Dr. Reed. Thank you. I, um, first of all, I was, I've just been very moved by um, all of the people speaking, all of my sister board members and um, the admin staff and support. I did just very, very moved and a very heartfelt. Um, and I just want to thank everyone who spoke tonight and, and everyone who sent me sentiments via email and phone calls. So I just want to just say that uh, first out front. Um, I'd like to just say a few words that I, I appreciate, I truly appreciated the opportunity to, um, to be on this board. And it's, um, it's an honor and a privilege to have been on it for the past four years. And I have really had a great opportunity to serve with excellent board members, such as past board member, Kate Parker, Ishmael Uyoa, and my sister board members currently, Wendy Simsmoten, Rose Munoz, Laura Caps, and Kate Ford. I also want to really state this uh, positively and wonderfully that I congratulate Wendy Simsmoten, Laura Caps, and Virginia Alvarez for um, taking on and continuing the, their, their progress uh, on the uh, board and also welcoming Virginia to, to the district. I look forward to supporting their leadership along with Rose Munoz and Kate Ford as a community member. And I'm dedicated as a community member to, to really support equity for all students and how I can do that in any way as a community member, I, I'm here. I also appreciate the opportunity to learn from and brainstorm with our past superintendent, Carrie Matsuoka. And thank you, Carrie, for your thoughtful comments tonight. I so appreciate you and the opportunity to have learned, worked and learned with you. And I'm thrilled with our new superintendent, uh, Hilda Maldonado. And I was thrilled to be a part of that process of hiring her. And um, I just feel we are so lucky to have her as our, our beacon to keep moving us forward. And um, Hilda, your, your communication and your transparency is just, um, it's just welcomed and, and so uh, it's made a difference, I think, in really connecting us with the community. I am really proud of our cabinet and administrative staff and the work that they have done for all of our students and for us to be at this point where we can move into this hybrid model. And so again, I appreciate the work that all of you have done. You're pivoting constantly, transitioning. I'm especially proud of our teachers and all the hard work they have done and the transitions that they've had to make to ensure our students are successful pre-COVID, COVID, and hopefully COVID and beyond, <laughs> which, which would be um, a great thing. I'm exceptionally proud of our students and the advocacy they have shown when they are wanting change. And I hope they will continue to be heard and supported as they bring forward new concerns or ideas for change. And last but certainly not least, I truly appreciate our parents and families in this community for their engagement in their students and really looking at the systems in place that we have in this district, especially during this challenging pandemic and asking important questions, probing questions, and I believe very necessary questions. I've made it clear that my number one priority has been a safe, healthy reopening of our schools and protecting students and staff in our community. And so it really is exciting 
So we have to continue to reflect on the data that we are getting uh, every day. But we're able to move to a hybrid model where we are able to actually have face-to-face -face contact, which is really the most optimum learning experience. But I'd just like to take a moment just to say what I'm proud of as part of being on this board and nothing in this board can be done alone or solely by one person. It's a board effort, it's a group effort, it's a community effort. And I, when I say that some of the things that I feel that I was involved in, it wouldn't have happened without unanimous support or the majority support of this board. And so I wanna acknowledge that, again, it's not me singly, it's me as a group. But what I am proud of is having been involved in and pushing for ethnic studies, high school requirement with community involvement, and really looking at how we can be more inclusive with our teaching practices. The supporting of student advocacy with the board and pushing for action steps based on the demands of our black student youth. And advocating for mental health supports, social emotional learning, early childhood programs and improved safety plans for our schools. And strongly advocating for evaluative systems to really look at our programming to ensure that the outcomes that these programs uh, provide are really what our students need and being really nimble in that and looking at that closely. And really also supporting the meta plan. I wanna really push and continue to say, I really hope that that continues to expand and grow as it should because it's support of cultural identity and it will decrease chronic absenteeism, high school suspension rates and really support our ELD emergent learners. So I am hopeful for the leadership going forward. I'm excited to see that we are going to have an amazingly diverse board of women leaders, along with our superintendent who will continue to push the needle for equity driven practices and student advocacy, which is why I wanted to be on this board in the first place. And finally, I'm hoping that my request for a plan to implement a student to be on this board will come to fruition. So I will be holding feet to the fire in my thoughts, <laughs> um, but just feel that I would hope that that would be something that could move forward because student advocacy now, as we heard in this report, and as I heard um, from our speaker tonight, is so vital. It's, it's really what, why we're here. We're here because of the students. So without student voice, what, what are we doing? We really have to listen to our students and be reflective of our, what our students say and be um, able to willing to, to listen and not just nod our heads, but devise plans and implement plans. And what I feel this board will do um, is that, is we'll support and continue that advocacy. So thank you again for this amazing opportunity to serve this district. And again, I, I, I am out there in the community. I will continue to do the work that I'm doing, but no, that I'm here to support in any way possible, should you need that. So Dr. Becchio, you might give me a call. Maybe I could do some <laughs> work volunteer because I will have some time now, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so maybe I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, thank you. And uh, I really, again, appreciate this time on the board and with my sister board members. Thank you, Dr. Reed. that was fantastic. Any other board members would like to share their correspondence or comments? I can't see. I think we're all good and moving on. Okay, excellent. Um, so just, just catching up here. Um, let's move to item D, which is acceptance of donations. Let's see, anyone, I need a motion. Oh, I see Ms. Sims Moton, sorry about that. I move with gratitude, accept the donations for the November 10, 2020. Excellent, and Ms. Ford, I see a second. Thanks so much, all in favor? Aye. Uh, motion carries. Okay, let's uh, quickly get through the consent agenda and then we'll take a break before, um, oh no, we can do public hearing as well. Um, so let's do items E and F and then we'll take a break as we sometimes have done before the action agenda. So that would be um, consent agenda. Do any item E, which is item E one through 10, do any uh, board members have any items they wish to pull? 
for questions or comments. I don't have any, seeing none. Okay, I need a motion to pass the consent agenda. Ms. Ford, thank you. I think I saw a second from Dr. Reed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, so now we will turn to our um, public hearing. I believe we do have one public speaker. Is that correct, Mr. Hugh? Yes, we do. We have okay. one public comment. Um, Great. That's item F1, which is public hearing sunshining of the Santa Barbara Unified School District proposal for successor contract negotiations with the California School Employees Association, which is an item, Dr. Becchio, but we'll move. Um, let's move to our public comment first. Okay, Ms. Karen McBride. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, uh, first, I just want to um, just take a, a moment to digress from my intended message. And I want to thank you, Dr. Reed, for your service uh, to the school board. And I really wish you the very best as you continue to inspire and to educate and care for the community. So thank you, Jackie. And uh, maybe you and I will be sitting beside each other as community members uh, if you if you choose to spend an occasional Tuesday night back here in the, in the boardroom. So I really appreciate your work. Um, my comments tonight are brief. I just wanna, I just want to um, mention as um, upcoming negotiations are upon us um, between the district and SBTA, uh, I just wanna state my support for what has been a shift to a more interest-based bargaining process and um, highlight that it's been a process that's um, yielded a lot of um, progress in the contract, I think. I appreciate the work of the district bargaining team and the SBTA bargaining team. And we've taken this progressive approach to existing contract language and taken some deep dives into parts of the contract that have brought about updates to contractual processes, such as evaluation, the evaluation process and an improved instructional council. These are things that we set up um, committees and worked on making changes over the course of an entire year. So in that same vein of making progress, I just want to remind the school board that investing in human resources by bringing up the salaries in the district to a more competitive level with surrounding districts could be the best investment you could make. And I know that funding could be very difficult and you're and we're gonna to have to make some tough decisions, but there's nothing that will pay off and be a better investment in the education of the kids in this, in this district than to have quality educators that stick around and grow their careers here. So it really should be a priority to attract and retain great teachers by offering competitive salaries. And, and veteran teachers too, who along with their newer colleagues have worked harder and longer hours than ever this year even more than many of those veteran teachers remember as first year teachers. And I just wanna uh, finish up by saying, I know I'm not stating things that are, or I'm, I'm stating things that are not unique to this season of negotiations, but we have some very unique challenges in the district and in public education on the whole. And I think we're gonna see changes to staffing. Um, and so having quality, teachers and competitive salaries moving forward is, is gonna really be um, so important as we all know that education is not gonna be the same as it was on March 13th, 2020. It's just, it's gonna change and you're gonna need the talent of the folks that are, are gonna come in the months and, and years to come. So thank you for focusing on on that and um, we will be talking with you as we go through the negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. And President Capps, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you so much. So Dr. Becchio, if you could please um, introduce item F1 and F2 and F3. We can take questions after each one or we can take them all in the aggregate. Sure. Thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to bring these um, three proposals for successor negotiations with our um, labor unions. Um, the first item F1 is the sunshining of our, um, our proposal for contract negotiations with California School Employees Association. And we intend, um, as the proposal puts forward to negotiate 
articles 21 and 27. So evaluations and vacation leave. Remember, this is a successor negotiations. And so we will be um, actually looking through the entire contract and um, republishing a new three-year contract. Any questions, comments? Any questions or comments on the first one? Uh, seeing none, you can continue. Oh, so item F2. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, Ms. Ms. Tim Smolton has her hand up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I think this may be a question. I just wanted some clarification, if you could, on Ms. McBride's comment about interest-based uh, progress. What, what does that mean? Um, interest. So her comment was related to interest-based bargaining which um, the, op the opposite approach is positional-based bargaining, which is we each take a position and we um, try to win our position and um, do some back and forth um, while winning that position. Um, interest-based bargaining is uh, more really um, understanding each other's interests in at the table and trying to come to a consensus around how best to get to a win-win um, at the negotiation table with whatever the topic is that we're dealing with. Thank you. Okay. Um, F2, item F2 is the public hearing and um, sunshining of the Santa Barbara Unified's proposal for successor contract negotiations with SBTA, Santa Barbara Teachers Association. Our intention in this proposal is to um, negotiate articles four, wages, articles five, health and welfare benefits, and articles six hours and conditions, article eight evaluation procedures. Any, oops. Any questions, comments on F2? Right. None. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, item F3 is the public hearing. It is the uh, Santa Barbara Teachers Association proposal for successor contract negotiations with Santa Barbara Unified and their intention to bring forward articles uh, four, wages and compensation, article five, health and welfare benefits, article six, hours and conditions, and article nine, special needs students. Thank you, Dr. Becchio. Any questions on F3? I can't see in the boardroom, so if you could holler, if you have one, I don't see anything, okay. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Becchio, for that um, for the public hearing portion. And now we will take a short break before we move into the action agenda. So let's see, what time is it? Eight forty. Um, five, ten minutes. Have a preference. Five. Let's do five. Keep moving. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back. And let's see, we'll be back at eight forty-six. So uh, we can move to item G one, which is approval of board policy five one one six. Dot one, interdistrict inter open enrollment. Dr. Wagnick, please walk us through it. Hey, I uh, apologize. Mr. Rouse is going to need to turn on my video, but I can certainly talk. You um, know what my face looks like. So um, um, approval of board policy 5116.1. There are two... Um, two pieces to this. First, I, I want to address um, the section under option to transfer. Um, we are asking the board to make an adjustment to, um, we're gonna make an adjustment to the request to transfer um, to prepare for the DLI or dual language immersion uh, program um, beginning next year, McKinley is going to be having, um, is going to be having a dual language immersion for two kindergarten classes. And, um, there, the reports I hear that most students, um, will want to partake in that program, but there will be some who do not, um, want to partake in the dual language immersion program. And so we're asking for um, students who do not want to partake to have an option to transfer um, and have priority of transfer um, 
and to either Harding, Monroe, or Washington, which are the three closest elementary schools to McKinley. So that's our first request that we're asking for. Um, the second request is a change under the section um, application and selection process. Um, because of the impact of the novel coronavirus pandemic this year, um, in order to allow families plenty of time to um, research schools and make their decision regarding um, transfer applications for next year, we're asking the board to permit us to extend the application process by two weeks. So instead of ending um, on January 15th, 2021, we would like for that um, to end on January 29th, 2021. So rather than the 15th, it will end on the 29th. Um, it will begin, the window will open on the same day, which is December 1st. And with that, I will take any questions that the board has. Great, thank you, Dr. Wagnick. And so we've just combined item F, F1 and two, um, so you can ask your questions on either, but we do need separate board action. So no, I actually, that, that is only F1. That's just the intra-district transfer. Um, I could, I will go ahead and I can talk to um, F2, which is inter-district attendance. We are proposing the same change regarding extending the deadline um, by two weeks to January 29th for inter-district transfers as well. Great. So uh, I'll take questions on uh, both uh, G1 and G2. Thank you so much. Any questions from the board? Ms. sims -Moten. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Um, So I had a question with regards to the option to transfer out. Uh, if they do not want to participate in the dual immersion, is there an option to transfer in from other schools? Um, yes, yes, there are. Um, my understanding from Ms. Larios Horton is that um, the way that the dual language immersion will work is that they will um, have um, a number of students who are English only speaking, a number of students who are Spanish only speaking, and then a certain percentage of students who are bilingual. And so, um, but McKinley students will have um, first rights uh, to those spaces. Ms. Larios Horton, did I get that right? That is correct, yes. And should there be additional spots, um, then we consider students from other schools as well. So just because, you know, maybe there's three, people, three uh, families that want to move out, doesn't this mean they will actually be just that, that would be three open spots. You will fill with McKinley students first. Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and one more question. What about transportation for those families who are normally uh, attending in McKinley and maybe they wanna to go to Monroe, Washington or Harding, will there be transportation for them? Well, currently we do not offer transportations for students who choose to transfer, but because this situation is different, um, we that is something we're going to have to consider and we haven't made a determination on that yet thank you thank you for those questions any other board members i can't see the rest of the uh, boardroom so um if you could let me know i don't see any hands up miss ford did you have a question no we're good okay so then we need an action um we have a motion on each one i misspoke it's g1 and g2 um Anyone like to make the motion? Ms. Ford. I'd like to um, uh, recommend that the board approve board policy 5116.1 intra-district open enrollment. Excellent, and I will second. I'm all in favor of flexibility right now. Um, thank you so much. Any, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye, motion carries. Now we need a motion for the second, G2. Dr. Reed, thank you. And a second by Ms. Ms. Moten. I move to approve board policy 5117 inter-district inter attendance. 
Great, thank you for uh, clarifying that. And I see the second with uh, Ms. Sims Moten. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wagnick. Now we move to- Thank you. Well, President item perhaps I'd just like to jump in and let you know that we are pulling item G8. Uh, we have oh, yes. to review the data for this item. So we will bring that back in next month's meeting. Thank you so much, Superintendent Maldonado. I meant to give you the floor for that. Thank you. Um, okay, so then we are moving to item G3. Uh, Dr. Becchio back on deck. Approval of the Santa Barbara Teachers Association proposal. Uh, so this is action on the public hearing that we just discussed. Their proposal for successor contract negotiations with the Santa Barbara Unified School District. That's correct. And I'm recommending that um, you've seen this twice now. I'm recommending that the board uh, officially approve uh, this proposal. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? I know we just had the opportunity, but you have another one before we take action. Okay. Seeing none, I need a motion. Well, I think that was Ms. Sims Moten. Excellent. And Dr. and Ms. Ford, a uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you so much. And now uh, item G4, approval of Santa Barbara Unified District proposal for successor contract negotiations with the California School Employees Association. Dr. Becchio, any? Recommending that the board take action by approving the, this proposal for contract negotiations with CSEA. Excellent. Any so, questions or a motion? Thank you, Ms. Ford, for the motion. Any, uh, I need a second. Dr. Reed, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Item G5, uh, same, Dr. Becchio, approval of the Santa Barbara Unified School District proposal for successor contract negotiations with the Santa Barbara Teachers Association. Yes, again, recommending that um, the board approve this uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Ms. Ford, with the motion and the second. Checking out the boardroom. Ms. Munoz, thanks for the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, that now we move back to Dr. Becchio with item G6, an item near and dear to my heart, approval of the 2021-2022 school calendar. All right, thank you very much. And I just wanted to give a really brief background of the development of the school calendar. Uh, this is something that this particular calendar, the 21-22 school year calendar is developed, uh, really starts back in January of last, of this, this year, but last school year. And um, we developed the calendar uh, in collaboration with our labor unions. Um, we also send out what we believe will be a close final uh, calendar to our part, our neighboring partner districts so that they can take a look at it um, and be aware of what we're planning because our schedules often are um, dependent upon each other and it's good for our community to be in sync with our partner districts. We then have a contractual obligation to um, come to an official agreement by August 31st with our um, with SBTA, and um, then once that happens, we in the fall bring this uh, calendar to the board for final approval. So I wanted you to be aware of the process that this calendar goes through prior to it coming to you. And with that, I want to um, open it for questions and also recommend the approval of this calendar. Thank you so much for that context. Actually, that helps me because again, I've, re I've raised this in the past and I did with you today. Um, oftentimes uh, schools use the final version of this uh, for parent communications and it's actually really, comp it's, it's more uh, opaque than I think we intend it to be for parents, for families who are just trying to figure out when is school and when is there not school. So if we could just phase that into the process that a, a, a family um, calendar that doesn't have, for example, you know, board holiday, because no one really, in my opinion, I don't know what that means. And we just take out some of the jargon uh, that's useful in uh, working with the unions, of course, and with teachers so that they have clarity. But if we could actually have parent calendars that are front and center on websites um, 
I've just, again, every year comes and rolls around and I get a handful of questions from parents. I can't tell, you know, when, when, when there's holidays and when there isn't just because of sort of the hieroglyphics on um, this. It's definitely improved, but I just would like to raise that request. Yes, thank you. And your, your recommendations um, were well received and, and I'm, I am taking a look at that to make some, some changes that, that you did recommend. We also have um, uh, the calendar on the website actually um, as a Google calendar. So someone could subscribe to our um, calendar as well. And um, those could come up on their phone as well also. Um, but those were good recommendations. We're trying to figure out how to how to change that slightly to be more user friendly for parents. Great. Yeah. Just again, just thinking about audience. Um, okay. So, any other questions or comments about the calendar? I don't think I see any. With that, we need a motion. I will move to approve uh, next year's calendar. Second. Thanks, Ms. Ford. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, uh, we do have a public speaker uh, for item G7. Um, why don't we go to the presentation first? I think that's helpful. Uh, approval of the 2020-21 elementary and secondary school plans. And that would be uh, Ms. Carey and Ms. Escobedo. And then we'll, we'll head to the uh, public speaker after your presentations. Good evening, board members. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present this action item. I'm actually going to hand it over to our directors of elementary and secondary education, Ms. Sierra Lockridge and Ann Roundy Harder, who have wor been working side by side with our principals in the development of their single uh, plans for student achievement. So um, Sierra and Ann, uh, take it away. Hi, good evening. Thank you, board members and Superintendent Maldonado. Uh, we're excited to share our single plans for student achievement with you this evening. Uh, the single plan for student achievement or what we call SIPSA is a blueprint for informing and improving the academic performance of all students, as well as addressing factors that impact performance, such as attendance, connectedness and engagement with school. Our SIPSAs address how categorical funds provided to the school will be used to improve student performance and school goals will be based upon an analysis of verifiable evidence-based state level data, such as CAS results and checks or the California Healthy Kids Survey. The plans are developed with a deep understanding of student academic challenges and successes, and they help identify research-based instructional strategies to raise the achievement of students who are not yet proficient. All elementary, junior high, and high school SIPSAs have been provided to you for your review and approval, hopefully tonight, for the 2021 school year. For more information on the SIPSA timeline, I'll turn it over now to my esteemed colleague and Director of Elementary Education, Sierra Lockridge. Thank you, Dr. Randy Harder. Good evening, board. Um, it's my pleasure to speak to you about the SIPSA process. And the screen that you are looking at now shows our timeline. Typically, you may recall that we would normally bring the, the SIPSA plans to you in the springtime for approval for the upcoming school year. Well, last year, as you all are aware, uh, school closure, COVID-19 hit. And not only were we unable to do that, the state actually extended the deadline and asked for SIPSAs to be done in the fall um, after the local, um, I'm sorry, the uh, learning continuity plan. So uh, tonight where we're at now is the no November 10th date. And as Dr. Roundy Harder mentioned, we uploaded our SIPSA plans, which are done through with principals and their school site councils, as well as feedback from their ELAC team. And uh, a lot of work and a lot of feedback goes into these plans. We're asking for you to uh, approve them tonight. And then we are going to be bringing you SIPSA 2.0. Uh, so I'm excited. I don't know if all our leaders are, but we are going to have the opportunity this year to get back on cycle and do a second SIPSA for you in the spring. What this means is that for the, this SIPSA, our principals were really thoughtful in what kind of formative data they could use 
to inform their goals so that when they go with their school site council again in the springtime, they can monitor their achievement towards those goals and then really set um, strong SIPSA goals for the new LCAP that will be adopted also in the spring um, and for the following school year. So this tonight's presentation is on our current school year, again, delayed from the spring, um, but bringing tonight in the fall for your approval. We will be back um, in the springtime for a second SIPs around, um, which will update you on all of our endeavors this year from the uh, learning continuity plan, which you all approved on September 8th to the SIPSAs today, November 10th, um, to being back on cycle to planning for the year that will be coming ahead, the 21-22, hopefully COVID-free school year, um, as well as a brand new three-year LCAP cycle. So we will be, um, that will be our timeline for this school year. Um, the one thing I'd like to point out is that the SIPSAs, the, the single plans, are closely aligned to the district's LCAP plan and to all of our other initiatives. So it's not done in a vacuum. It's done through a very, very thoughtful process. And I'm going to turn it back over to Anne to tell you more about that alignment and, and the goals that um, the principals and their teams have developed. Thanks, Ms. Lockridge. So as we can see in this graphic, we have three LCAP goals. And just a reminder that LCAP stands for Local Control and Accountability Plan, which is currently on a slight pause as we have shifted gears under COVID to the Learning Continuity Plan, which is down at the bottom of this slide. But the SIPSAs are written to align and weave together strongly the LCAP goals that we see at the top here around closing opportunity gaps through culturally sustaining organizational transformation, creating and sustaining safe and affirming learning environments, and using relevant and inclusive curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Even within those three goals, which were informed through school and public and community input, we can see that there is overlap because nothing we do is in isolation. So just as that's true with the LCAP, so it is with the SIPSAs. And in the SIPSAs, even though they are written as single plans for each school, we see there are some common threads and goals. And this is very appropriate uh, because we have, are of course a united and unified school district. So under the elementary SIPSAs, these are some of the trends that can be seen. We see an emphasis on multi-tiered systems of supports. So giving good first instructions to students and then providing additional interventions and supports for them when they need it, as shown through data, such as reading scores, literacy scores, math scores, and so on. We also see an emphasis across the elementary SIPSAs on an asset-based and culturally sustaining pedagogy, meaning teaching style and manners and strategies that will support in particular our emerging multilingual students and add an additional layer or systematic tier two, which would be for those students who need additional supports based on their first round of instruction. That's what we call tier two. Similarly, in the junior highs, we see a continued focus on similar student groups, our emerging multilingual students, our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, and students with disabilities who need additional supports in order to achieve equitably. We also see a focus on decreasing chronic absenteeism and increasing connectedness and engagement with schools. And this is shown most clearly in the California Healthy Kids survey data. We also see an emphasis now as we move towards greater emphasis on college and career readiness to make sure that we are increasing our English language arts and math scores, especially for the student groups as noted. Similarly in high school, we also see a focus on our emerging multilingual students and students with disabilities, and a slight shift here in increasing the A to G rates. So what we're talking about there is getting kids ready for CSU and UC and other college and university experiences beyond the high school, which has increasing emphasis, of course, in high school. 
We also see a wish to decrease the chronic absenteeism rates, which means get kids with us more frequently so they can learn better and to incre increase their engagement and connectedness to school. Because we know when kids feel connected, when they feel cared for, when they feel they have a purpose in coming to school, they want to come to school, which helps with absenteeism, and then they'll be learning and more engaged for better achievement. So we also see across the high schools that we wanna make sure our students are really ready for the 21st century in all kinds of skills, including the critical thinking, creativity, communication, and so on. And then also, as in all areas, we wanna make sure that we're increasing the English language arts and math scores based on state tests all across the board for our students. This connects up with our current learning continuity plan priorities, as you see listed at the bottom here, which interweave all of these strategies along with additional layers of supports, such as the technical aspects, as we might say with technology, every, ensuring that every student has iPads and one-to-one -one access with Wi-Fi and a big shout out to our ETS department for really supporting us in those efforts with communication and learning and supports as noted above. And then with an emphasis on making sure that all students feel included and understood for who they are every day that they come to school, whether that's remotely or on campus through anti-racism efforts. And now uh, Sierra will bring it home for us with the next slide. Thank you. Um, as Anne right, uh, rightfully noted, the LCAP goals of a safe and affirming, relevant, inclusive curriculum and um, transforming the organization really set the tone for all of our work including the, the individual site plans, but it also is not done, as I mentioned earlier, in a vacuum, it's done in connection and in parallel with a lot of our other initiatives. And that's what this slide shows. The organizational transformation initiatives that you've heard about tonight and over the past few board meetings, including the, the META plan, the learning continuity plan, in a moment you're gonna hear about our plan to address the significant disproportionality of uh, Latinx students identified for special ed. Um, Data-driven intervention, this is something our superintendent Maldonado has really been uh, pushing us on, as well as the importance of having children seeing themselves reflected in the curriculum and having teachers consider their backgrounds and cultures when they're designing the pedagogy and instruction. All of those things work together in concert to ensure that we will have the global learners that you see identified in that instructional framework uh, graph. And you'll see that swimming around those global learners are the things that all of our plans are working on. Making sure that we have relevant and inclusive curriculum, um, instruction and assessment. Assessment is a big part of having the right assessments and the, the right data to inform our decisions as well as ensuring that they're not biased. Um, one thing I'd like to point out on the right side of our framework, um, in addition to having a safe and affirming learning environments, which is clearly an LCAP goal, is that we want to have continuous improvement. Um, Dr. Ann Roundy Harder spoke to that in, in the SIPSA goals. You'll see it in the plans themselves, that this is the data that um, principals and school site councils and teams are monitoring and making strides for. And that's going to be accomplished with high functioning teams. Um, I, I'd like to, to thank my ed service team. I think that that's a high functioning team that I'm glad to be a part of. And um, I really want to give a big shout out to the principals and their school site council for the work that they did on this plan. It is um, a lot of thought goes into it. They look at what how they spent their money last year, how it it worked or didn't work, they do that data analysis, they identify the needs for their site, and then come up with meaningful, uh, measurable goals that will ensure that we have the global learners that we all are here uh, to cultivate. And that's why you are here on the board and we are here tonight uh, presenting this. Um, so I will just sum it up by saying that in order for organizational transformation to occur, all of these things have to be working in concert together. Um, 
So the, the LCP plan, that is the basis through COVID to, to provide us with the, the equipment and tools and, and learning continuity we need. The META, that's our the oxygen that is going to carry us through all of our initiatives and really make sure we center our kids. And you'll be hearing more about uh, language literacy and the love of learning pathway that we are going to create in our elementary schools so that literacy and language and the love of learning is front and center in um, all, all that we do. So I'll close by just saying that all of these things work together and we really thank you for reading through these plans. And we are making a recommendation at this point for you to approve them tonight, knowing that in the spring, we will be back with another set and an update on how well these plans worked and continuing to um, you know, be high performing and continuous improvement through that method. And I'll, I'll turn it over to you for any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have um, one public speaker on this in this topic. Mr. Hill. Yes, we have um, Ms. Moni DeWitt. Uh, one moment. Thank you. Thank you, sorry for the delay. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk and I uh, wanna congratulate Jackie Reed for all her hard work and hope she has a good time away from the board. But um, more to the point, I'm, I'm very concerned about what I see here. Although there are things that are good like cultural relevancy and making sure our students feel included and see themselves in the material there's a big piece that's missing and it is evidence-based. And that is that our district is still relying on Lucy Calkins balanced literacy approach. And you'll, you'll see if you Google like back in October, a few weeks back, um, Emily Hanford, Lucy Calkins herself has come out and backpedaled on the efficiency of her program saying that it clearly doesn't work for all students and the English language learners as well as the special ed students struggle with um, needing an explicit approach in order to read and this is so clear um, it's in you know everybody agrees about it look at Sally Shaywitz and our district needs to consider this because our scores have been stagnant for three years straight we lost our parent resource center which was bilingual and very empowering to the Latinx students and the group of stakeholders who came up with this plan did not include outside advocates like perhaps Sherry Ray or Joan Esposito who really had hands-on experience for those very many students who don't make it and are an embarrassment to our system. I know you all have good intentions, but we need systemic change to close that achievement gap. And we need the science of reading. We need a proactive choice uh, approach, not the wait to fail approach automatic testing in the K through three space and also teacher investment. And these are all um, evidence-based and best practices. And I really don't want our district to settle for less because you know kids with um, differences are at a negative 113 on the CAP scores and that hasn't moved incrementally by one or two percent. This is not equity and it impacts our students who um, qualify for the free lunches much more, which are also our students of poverty and hit the English language learners. So we can't, I, I would like to hear the board talk about this and I would like to see dyslexia listed um, to the special ed leadership on the 13 things. It's supposed to be there and it isn't, it's not even there. And I, I graciously reminded you in September that October's Dyslexia Awareness Month and our culture doesn't even want to bring it up. You know, we feel forgotten and we'd like you to follow the established norms. So please consider it and don't pass this. It's not complete and it won't be effective. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you to our speaker for her advocacy. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Ms. Ford. Uh, thanks. I have a few. Um, first of all, I'm not sure to whom I should address this, but I, I know the school site councils are involved, but to what extent are the teachers involved in the process? Uh, 
Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> uh, each school site council has a teacher as well as classified representation as part of the members. And typically what principals do is they present their SIPSA plan as well as the LCAP plan uh, once we will finalize that to both their classified and certificated staff for input uh, on the whole. But there is representation of a, a principal um, in the elementary space is typically 10, so you, you know the composition, and there's uh, two teachers there and one classified staff. So when you say that uh, it, it's shown to them for input, is it after tonight or before tonight? Well, it would be why they are doing their school site council, so before. And remember this SIPSA, we started last year. So right. when they first started looking at this SIPSA, it was in February because we were preparing to bring it to you in May. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, so you'll see a lot of thought went into that because they not only had to flip for COVID, but they're also starting a year um, and, and reporting on the same year. So definitely, I, I can imagine that those conversations were even more robust than they typically are in a normal uh, school cycle. But um, part of a, a staff meeting should be, uh, uh, this is the plan for the year, this is our goals, da, da, da. feedback um, at that time before you would go in May. But this year is a little bit um, more of a challenge because of COVID, I would say. For sure. So what's the plan in this year for district oversight of the plans and the achievement of the goals? So Sierra and I actually read every single SIPSA and give feedback to them before they're finalized. And so that's our opportunity um, to dialogue with the principals. Additionally, prior to the SIPSAs being written, we have several input sessions where they can get feedback and help on their SIPSAs and the process for that. So we try to be really available and make it a very interactive process uh, all along the way. And so as Sierra noted, the, this SIPSA is an odd cycle because we're sort of halfway, partway through the year. They were started prior. We do not have state CASP scores uh, from the spring as we normally would. So it's a little bit of older data at this point. So there's, but there have been many opportunities for input, not only in staff meetings, but also many of, I would say most of the principals, I can't speak for every single one because I'm not at the elementary level, but uh, they also share this with their site leadership teams, which are made up of teacher representatives from at the secondary level, all the different departments and from different grade levels at elementary. So there are many ways that people are looking at the data to be able to inform the SIPSAs, not just on the academic achievement, but I do want to note also that they talk about the connectedness, the engagement strategies for supporting students in multiple ways with their social emotional needs, as well as the academic needs. And typically those conversations, like I said, happen in staff meetings, as well as in the site leadership team meetings. Thanks. And then um, how both for both of you really, as, since you've read them and you know them pretty well, how, how do you think these plans reflect an understanding or at least the concerns that are raised about COVID-19 and the COVID slide? What it, how did it affect the content? Sarah, can I start and then you go? Is that okay? Uh, so I would say that they very much reflect an awareness of the need that we expect some learning loss to be happening due to the conditions that we're all under, both from the stress and strain that's on the students and meeting their emotional needs and greater connectedness through a screen and so forth, um, as well as an awareness that we have to shift the way that we're providing those interventions. So for example, some of the things that we uh, saw in the SIPSAs in February, such as after school tutoring. Well, what does that mean in an all remote environment? And so some of the, some of the actions shifted to address the fact that we're currently in distance learning and anticipate being in hybrid learning. And so it might be offering the tutoring in a different format, for example, or understanding that we need to hire additional uh, counseling to support the emotional needs of the students going through a lot of trauma at this time. So I definitely saw a shift from um, say, you know, eight or nine months ago 
uh, to now in the SIPs is that was very directly detailed in the actions, Thank but you. still focusing on supporting students. Yeah, I would concur. I think one of the, the shifts that stood out to me the most was the use because of the, the data being delayed with the state tests, the, the emphasis on formative assessments and cycles of inquiry um, with those school leadership teams that Ann spoke about and really using the school uh, site implementation plans that we use for continuous learning um, to guide that, as well as I saw a lot more social emotional goals in the elementary SIPSAs and a, a much more team approach to looking at the whole child data. So it's not just the STAR literacy test, but it's also our running records, it's our attendance, it's whether or not they're being referred for calm and really much more strategic actions of how those teams can work together. Um, school leadership teams meet monthly. Um, I saw a lot more tier two, which I was very excited about because I really believe that that's an, a huge opportunity for us, as well as really dialing in uh, the multiple tiered uh, systems of support, whether it's in behavior like PBIS or solid tier two instruction. And um, I think you'll see, and you, I'm sure you did as you read them, a real emphasis on making sure that the literacy, the phonics and uh, phonological awareness is front and center, uh, especially in the TK through third space. Thanks so much to both of you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Thank you to the team for those answers. Any other questions or comments? Jackie Reed has her hand up. Dr. Reed, thanks. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say, first of all and foremost, I mean, from when the first time I saw SIPSA four years ago to where I am now, we've made great inroads. So, hallelujah. Um, I really want to acknowledge that. And the transparency of the process, because I remember we had the forums were so detail oriented and they were very difficult to really read and, and they weren't as transparent. Um, as this is. And I think it's more simplistic and sort of done a deeper dive into the key areas. And I appreciate that as well. Um, my question is, I guess going back to literacy, you know, we're, we, we're really looking at how can we improve our literacy scores across all district schools? What can we be doing? And I kind of want to pinpoint the data-driven intervention piece and just ask a little bit more about um, are each of the schools consistently working on data-driven strategies with their principals and their teachers and how, how I know that hasn't been consistent in the past. So what steps are being made to ensure that this is going to be done in a more system, you know, systemic way, that it's across each school, that there's going to be a deeper dive into data to really look at how we can strategize to improve our literacy scores. So um, I would say that we've come a long way to your point earlier on our SIPSAs and having them not only be aligned with our, our LCAP, um, but also um, we have an assessment calendar now that we, we hadn't had in years past that really makes sure that we're looking at the same time at the same test for kids. We have a, a literacy coach team that has been supporting teachers in doing running records. We added this year the words their way, which is a vocabulary and does phonics uh, instruction. And that has a whole fleet of assessments that we can dive into as well. Um, the MTSS by definition requires us to think about where students are in all of those tiers. So tier one, it makes us think about our first instruction. And that's something that uh, Ana Escobedo and I have been talking a lot about. And we look forward to coming back to the board with a, a proposal on uh, language because we know language matters, especially for our emergent multilingual students on literacy, as you've heard from um, our community advocates matters. Um, and really a love of learning. So we'll be bringing that as well to you. But I think what I noticed most from reading all of the elementary SIPSAs, and they got to spend a lot of time with me either on Zoom 
or just typing it out back and forth, have you considered this, is that they're using the data charts and their grade level teams to have much more robust and evidence-based conversations. And those evidence-based conversations inform their instructions, which helps tier one. And then we know who needs help with tier two, and we're gonna get a much more solid on that. You'll see later on this evening when we talk about significant disproportionality. And then we're also making sure that the SST process so that we know if a student really needs that special ed support, they're getting it because we've done the, the systematic and the, the research-based um, instruction. And I think for Anne and I, one of our biggest pushes this year has been helping our principal leaders think through what exactly is the best practices and evidence based because we've tried a lot of things in the past, as, as you know, being a board member and all of you know, but there are things that are tried and true and that work and we have the evidence to back that. Um, and, and we know that systematic targeted direct instruction works. We know that uh, language access works. We know that certain things create bigger gains and that when we follow a cycle of inquiry where teacher teams, the ones actually the practitioners are looking at the work and having those discussions, the, the better um, all of our schools will move in the future. So I think you'll see a lot of that in the plans. You'll see the, the principals writing about MTSS, social emotional goals, tier two and cycles of inquiry um, among their team. And I think that that alignment is going to get us to the next level. Um, and I know you'll be watching us and, and, and cheering for us and um, we'll be happy to present those in the spring as well. I think Siri has stated that really well. And the only other piece that I might add to that is that we are really with the help of Maria Larios Horton and her team really supporting our English, our emerging multilingual um, students with better designated and integrated ELD curriculum and pedagogy. And that's extremely important because as we've reviewed um, what we've been offering, we have come to awareness through the data that it has not been what we have offered in the past has not been as successful and so we've had intensive professional development in this area that will be continuing into the future as we roll it out to even more uh, teachers particularly in the secondary space in the area of integrated ELD um, and so this board recently thank you approved a new curriculum for our students that we believe is robust engaging rigorous and supportive of um, linguistically sustaining practices so that our students can emerge college and career ready and multilingual. Thank you. I mean, I appreciate your team approach too, because you're coming from different perspectives and then you're coming together with this comprehensive plan. And um, I just want to acknowledge that. And I think just as a layman, because I, I understand what you're saying, but it's also, I would say for the average parent to say, well, what exactly does that mean in my school with my student in this situation? What is my teacher and my principal framing for my student to achieve? And so I would just only say as, um, you know, just a comment is that it would be nice to have a transparent or even a conversation of what that looks like for people to actually understand what this language means. What does it mean to be data-driven? What does it mean to see the evidence? What, what sort of strategies are actually being done? And then the other piece I would just add is, we know the best practices at, let's say Franklin, right? Where they're, they're working and that those, those best practices are brought together. And I think we've brought that up in the past that how do we ensure that those best practices that have success are also being utilized across the schools? So I'm assuming that it's a plan like this, it's these SIPs and plans, it's the statement of what, what the intent of those particular schools are going to do, but really holding accountability to what, you know, it, it, what are the outcomes? Are those outcomes happening? And having that, I, I guess I would say it's difficult to think that you have to wait quite a while before we know the results of these SIPs. Like the process of uncovering what is actually being done would be, really important to see or hear um, in between in between times, you know, because I just know that 
we've been saying literacy and we need a plan, but I don't really understand what is it. Like, I can't really grasp it. I can see the language, I can read it, I can see the plan, but I just, what does it mean to my students in, or my child in this classroom with this principal and what sort of strategy is that? So I'm just speaking from uh, how a parent might feel about what is going on in their classroom and their child. Um, but again, I would say the plan, I understand it. I just don't, I just feel like it might be more practical to, to provide opportunities to hear what's going on in a practical sense at different school sites. I really appreciate that feedback so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Reed, thank you for that. I do want to uh, get us to the next presentation. I think we want to wrap up um, with the other issue that we have with significant disproportionality. But I do want to say that for people who are out there in the public listening to this, and you know, the, the four questions from DeFore really laid out. What do kids need to know? How do we know they're learning it? What are we going to do when they're not learning it? And what are we going to do when they are learning it? Are some of the guiding questions that will drive all the decisions we make? And we want to make sure that parents know that and teachers know how to speak to parents about it. And we want to have continuous testing so that we know that we're getting kids to what they need to as they move up the grade level. So those are simple ways of us explaining it, but we'll certainly do some work around our parent engagement policies to get that, that uh, clarity that you speak of. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Yes, thank you, Superintendent Maldonado. That's a good wrap up. Are we are we good to move forward on an action here? Uh, Ms. Sims has her hand up. Oh, okay, uh, Ms. Sims Bowen. Thank you. I have a couple, just a couple questions, just uh, to um, understand. So I appreciate the having it more clear for parents to really understand and be able to ask more important questions. So I appreciate the work uh, going towards that. I did have a question because we are kind of straddling. Um, COVID, pre-COVID and in between COVID and there's an adjusted schedule. So in the plans that, that are being presented tonight, is it only incorporating pre-COVID or are we incorporating some things we've learned during COVID that we're gonna be working on? They definitely incorporate, thank you so much for that question. They definitely incorporate the conditions that we're under now where we understand that we're currently in distance learning and we will have some students that will continue in distance learning all through the year. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, that's where we can see specific changes in the plans from as they were written in a first draft format early in the spring or last winter even to now in terms of shifts in, you know, we may not be able to do all these things in groups in person together as we had planned. So what else can we do instead? So I do believe that while we will see uh, some continuity certainly of the plans in addressing things such as the chronic absenteeism and the connectedness to school. Well, what does connectedness to school look like when you're not on campus, for example? So that some of the language we expect to change, um, not so much the goals because the goals are aligned to the LCAP and the specific needs which will be continuing through the school year, but the specific strategies and actions we can expect to shift as we move into hybrid and Fingers crossed, we all wear our masks, we socially distance, we hand wash, and we're all able to be back together again uh, sooner rather than later. I hope that answered your question. It, it did, thank you. And, and the other question, I, I noticed that in the learning uh, continuity plan priority, we have anti-racism. I don't recall that being there before. Am I missing or was it implicit bias? Or was it just something different? And the reason that I'm asking because I didn't necessarily seeing it um, addressed in the plans. And again, I know we're straddling, you know, two different times. And so I just think I really want to be able to see that what are we actually doing specifically on that, not just putting it there as a label or something we're going to look like. I really want to see us drill down on what that looks like um, and how we're going to what what does it look like anti-racism and how does it get us toward our goals? How does it increase criticism? How do we talk about all those things that we're trying to do here? So it's really important. If, how we dig down a little bit deeper with regards to that uh, being a goal. And I appreciate it that it being there. And the last question, and most of it just a comment. And the last thing that I would make is we had we talked about culturally, linguistically sustaining curriculum. Where does culturally um, sustaining curriculum come in? Where is our curriculum in terms of cultural, in terms of books or uh, processes or all those things? Where is that 
where is that being sustained? And maybe it's in, I didn't, didn't see it in the plans, but if we're gonna have it there, where, where does that look in plain English? Where does that look and where is it? Um, Sarah, do you wanna talk about LLI, for example? Uh, sure, um, in, in the learning continuity plan, uh, we did talk about uh, level library intervention as well as um, addressing anti-racism. Uh, to your point, uh, Ms. Sims Moten, we know that that is that that's the work we got we need to do, and uh, we that is in the LCP plan. But you also see it in the people addressing the implicit bias needs and the call to proficiency needs at their own sites. I think the thing that stood out the most to to, to me um, is the social emotional learning, especially for, for, for young kids um, that I saw so evident in, in the, the site plans um, with goals and they even adjusted their goals for distance learning and how they could monitor student attention uh, because we're concerned about their chronic absenteeism. We're concerned that kids need to see themselves. And in, in pretty much every single elementary SIPSA, you will see that they used all of their library funds to buy uh, books that create mirrors and windows for kids. Um, additionally, you'll see that, um, for example, um, Cleveland, which is our, our CSI school, is going through um, a evaluation of their pedagogy to make sure that they're not deficit-based, but asset-based. So taking those meta through lines, that's, I think, the biggest thing difference you'll see in our plans is those meta through lines are in the plans now and they weren't in the past. And so that is going to get us closer to being the anti-racist leaders and district that we need to be and ultimately closer to student opportunities and improved achievement. Um, so I think you will see that along with the social emotional um, piece really being represented in, in the SIPSAs today. And, and to your to all of your point about the, the data, we're really lucky this time because we're gonna come back to you in the spring and we're gonna be able to say, look, this is what we set out to do. Here's the formative data. Here's how our school leadership teams have been looking at it in cycles of inquiry. Here's how we've improved our MTSS or our, our tier two or tutoring or whatever it may be. And then we're going to see if that still holds and if that's the course before we even worry about this, the state exam, which we will obviously um, analyze as well um, for the following one. So I, I think that you'll see it um, embedded throughout, but the, bi the big piece is on, on the social emotional, on having those books and, and really having those, those conversations with teachers on professional learning through the meta lens um, and getting everyone to really think about what our students bring and 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 how we honor that and how we meet them uh, there. Yeah, and I just have one final comment. I think also as we look at the anti-racism and, and how we uh, decide to do that, but it's important that we look and see each other. That's often missing too, right? We can talk about is race and different, but how do we see each other and work together in terms of that? So because racism goes across, it's just not just one-sided racism, it's, it's across. And so it's important to make sure that we are seeing each other and having those conversations and then the last thing I would say is that I think it's also important that I don't know if SIPs is, uh, if the preschools are part of this, but I think that that's the early part of, of you know looking at anti-racism as well, you know racism as well. I mean I am happy to bring the literature and resources with regard to first five, but we're working across the state to also work with the district, and we're already looking at preschool because you know kids as young as three four are seeing the differences, right? And so how do we teach them to talk about it? How do we teach the things that words that they may hear may not necessarily understand, but when they see it at their level and understanding, I think that's really critical because by the time they get to K T12, that particular, they're ready because they're used to that and they can they understand and respect those differences and, and, and then get to see who they are along with others who may be different than they are. So I, I want us to maybe incorporate that, how we're working with those preschools to make sure that we're again just talking on that early. You know the early arc of all these things that we can really be much stronger by the time we get there. So thank you again for this plan. I appreciate where you're going with that, and I appreciate you uh, being receptive to our to our feedback with regard to that. No, well, absolutely. I think you have a uh, Daisy Ochoa, which would be happy to to come back and present. And she, I thought she did great tonight. Um, 
But I think, you know, we've all seen the doll test. We all know that it starts early and that race is a social construct. And so we need to be able to identify that and have those conversations early on because that'll just make all of us better and, and our kids are, they're, they're watching. So um, we definitely will take that note and I'll work with principals on the next ones to, especially the ones that have on-site preschools. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Ms. Lockridge and Dr. Roundy Harder and Ms. Simpson for your question. I would love to move us forward because we still have a big uh, item to get to. I don't want to deny any board members the opportunity, but certainly is there, um, are we good to move forward? I can't see Rose. I, I, I would like to add, if it's not too late, I would just like to add, I, I do want to address um, Ms. Sims Moten's um, question about how are we going to see this uh, in, our, in our schools? I think it's an important question and I'll be brief. Um, a couple of months ago, or maybe it was just a month ago, um, this board um, approved a contract with Hanover Research and Hanover Research is producing tools um, to include uh, self-evaluation rubrics and curated resources for our schools. And this is really important because we want to make sure that the work that we do around a culturally and linguistically sustaining curriculum is done using common language and common tools across schools. And so um, we are working diligently with Hanover Research to develop science or research-based and research-proven tools um, that our administrators would be able to use um, and be able to discuss um, in common ways across our, our, our schools. Um, so I just wanted to, to remind us of that um, particular partnership that we have in developing tools to assist our schools. Thank you, Ms. Laris Horton. Okay, with that, I, I think that our board members are ready for a motion to approve uh, the recommended plans here. Do I see a motion, Dr. Reed? So moved. Thank you, and a second, Ms. Ford. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries, thanks so much. Now we're moving to H2, which is our last, um, meaty uh, agenda item, which is a discussion and report on significant disproportionality. Dr. Wagnick will hear your presentation and then we do have one public speaker for this as well. So uh, thank you, Dr. Wagnick. Yeah, I'd like to uh, jump in really quick. Uh, of course. I apologize. Uh, thank you, uh, board members. Thank you for this robust discussion. And I wanna just let the board members know that we are working really hard to make connections between all of these plans so that while some of these are compliance-based requirements for our funding and other areas, uh, the, the continued support and connections that we get between all the departments that you see uh, here tonight is gonna make this successful along with the work with our superintendents. I wanna start off the significant disproportionality conversation. And it's a little bit of what we've talked about tonight, but there's a research uh, study in a book by uh, authors Guinier and Torres called The Miner's Canary, which uses the metaphor for the canary in the coal mine as the warning about some of the environmental conditions that can impact a canary going into a mine, as opposed to naming the canary as being the problem. And I think it speaks to everything that we're hearing about tonight. As educators, we're gonna to continue to challenge our thinking, challenge our systems and structures, if we're gonna break these cycles that are not clearly serving our students well. And in many instances, we find that educators may not be paying attention to some of the outside factors, like our depressed socioeconomic conditions that are being brought forward in, in this COVID time, health and educational conditions that are encountered by many people of color, and how these conditions have existed for a long time and have uh, not always been challenging the structures of power that are in place. So many times our educators can pathologize our people of color in similar to blaming the canary instead of assessing our environmental conditions that our students can find themselves in. So as we look at the next report, as we think about the LCAP, the SIPSAS and all the other requirements that we have, we will continue to challenge our conditions in our system that have led to the results that we are seeing and continue to make a commitment to dismantle some of these conditions that exist so that we can better serve our students. So I just wanna make sure that uh, board members, you understand that huge commitment, but also that we're gonna make uh, connections and 
create coherence amongst all these plants so that you're not feeling like you're constantly asking the same questions or that they somehow are disconnected, but really drawing connections to all our work. So with that, I'd like to just hand it over to the team led by Dr. Wagenek. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Ms. Caps, uh, Ms. Maldonado and the board. Um, I wanna briefly say that um, this work began many months ago, pre-COVID. In fact, three of us were on a, a trip in early March working on this um, and remember seeing um, people with masks in the San Francisco airport and thinking maybe they were overreacting but weren't quite sure. And so now here we are. So throughout the pandemic, we've been working on this report. I'm really thankful to be a part of this great team that's gonna to present to you tonight. And so right now I will turn it over to um, Mr. Shetler who will lead, lead us off. Go ahead, Mr. Shetler. Okay, good evening, Superintendent Maldonado, Board President Caps and School Board. Tonight we will be sharing information about a systemic and long-standing issue facing the district. We hope to shed some light on how we arrived at this point and what we are proposing be done to address it going forward. It's important to note that for purposes of the significant disproportionality work prescribed by the California Department of Education, some of the actions proposed in this report are for our identified target group. This target group, which we'll talk more about, makes up roughly 1% of the school district's total enrollment. The process requires that we track this group over time to determine whether our actions are having the intended effects. We want to be clear though, we intend to make changes to systems that are much broader in scope than just our target group. Following tonight's board meeting, we'll be finalizing a plan to submit to the California Department of Ed, and we welcome input from the board in response to this report. Next slide, please. Each year, the California Department of Education reviews data from school districts to determine whether groups of students are disproportionately represented in special education. The state uses a mathematical formula to determine a risk ratio, which tells <clears throat> us when a particular subgroup of students is more or less likely to be identified in need of special education based on their race or ethnicity. Santa Barbara Unified has been identified for significant disproportionality due to the number of Hispanic or Latinx students in special education under the category of specific learning disability for three straight years. Next slide. Thank you, Director Shetler. Um, good evening again, board. Um, Sierra, I, I have one more. Oh. I think we went ahead by um, one too many. There we go. Our risk ratio shows that Latinx students are more than three times as likely to be identified as having learning disabilities compared to their peers. We can also understand this in terms of percentages. During the 16, 17, 17, 18, and 18, 19 school years, the percentage of Latinx students in the district who were identified as having learning disabilities were 9.3, nine and 9% respectively. For comparison, 2.7, 2.4, and 2.4% of white students were identified as having learning disabilities during the same three-year span. In many ways, we have misinterpreted student struggles in class as evidence of a disability, when instead, we should be looking at what is or is not happening with our instruction and support. Misidentifying a student as disabled can result in lowered expectations. It increases the likelihood that school staff will continue to see the student's struggles as primarily determined by how their minds are wired rather than by what the adults are doing. At this point, I'd like to hand over the slide presentation to Sierra Lockridge, who'll talk to you more about the process we've been working through since being identified for significant disproportionality. Thank you, John. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. What you were saying uh, is, is so important. Um, you know, three times the amount of our Latinx students 
have been identified with a, a specific learning disability. And we know that, 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 that that's just not the, the case. Um, and as Superintendent Maldonado was mentioning, this work is probably our most important work and it is gonna permeate all of our endeavors. Uh, that means gen ed, which I'm representing here tonight, and special ed, which John Shetler is representing, are going to have to work together uh, to address this disproportionality. Um, as John mentioned, uh, we are required by the state to engage in a programmatic improvement process and really to apply a cultural lens to that process. It is a phase one, uh, four phase pro process. Phase one um, meant that we did go up to, to San Francisco and learn about what disproportionality is and how um, it impacts students and, and student achievement. And then we met with a consultant. We're lucky to have a state consultant, Maureen Burness, who's um, guiding the team. The next part of getting started was identifying a leadership team. And those are the people that you will be hearing from tonight in this presentation and um, identifying a stakeholder group. And we put a lot of thought into who those stakeholders would, will be. Um, and in, in a slide or so, I will introduce them to you. But um, their backgrounds are unique. Uh, their backgrounds are diverse and they are really poised to give us the critical kind of feedback we need to ensure that this is a plan uh, that has meat and, and, can, and can bear fruit. Um, so phase one is just about establishing the team, leadership team, having a consultant, and identifying your stakeholders and gathering all the relevant data that we would need to look at when we go to stage two, which is root cause. Um, so for the root cause analysis, we looked at uh, data including special ed referrals, uh, when they were happening, what grade levels they were happening, what data was being used to determine this. And we really identified that it was um, starting in about third grade in elementary. And we'll, we'll tell you more about that uh, when Dr. Ragnick talks about the root causes. Um, but once we had the data um, and the demographic data, the SST data, we were able to convene the stakeholder group that I spoke about. And that, that began phase two. Um, we conducted an LEA, which is a local educational agency initiative inventory that means looking at all of our initiatives and asking uh, whether or not this is contributing as a, a causal factor to the disproportionality of our district. And you'll hear more about that when we get to root causes as well. Additionally, we did a programmatic self-assessment uh, and many members on the team uh, wrote and addressed that, including our assistant soups of secondary um, and elementary. Um, as well as other team members. And then lastly, we went to that stakeholder group and we presented all the data that we had looked at, the self-assessment, uh, the initiative inventory, and they helped us identify and define our root causes. So once we had those root causes in place, we were ready to begin phase three. Uh, phase three meant that we refined our um, root causes and identified actionable items and metrics for those. Now this is a 27 month plan uh, per CDE. Um, and we are here tonight as part of phase three, uh, presenting the plan to you uh, for your input as well. Um, when we took it back to the stakeholder team, they were able to give us feedback and input uh, that further refined uh, the plan that we will be submitting in December to the state for approval. And once that is approved, we will be in the most exciting phase, which is uh, phase four, where we'll be implementing um, and then continuing to evaluate with our stakeholder group um, these actions. Um, so we are now in step three, um, the development of the plan based on the root cause analysis um, and I'll ultimately utilizing evidence-based practices. If you'll go to the next slide, uh, one of the important features of the plan is that we have to set aside 15% of our federal special education funding. So I wanna make this very clear. It's our federal special education funding. 
um, which turns out to be about $371,278 to be used over the next 27 months strategically. And I wanna make sure that everyone is aware that this does not um, result in a change of services or anything for our special ed students. They will continue to have the appropriate supports that they need. This money is just earmarked to do um, to address this disproportionality that we have. Um, and you can take us to the next slide, please. So this is our team of stakeholders. Uh, this is the team that has uh, grappled with and will continue to grapple with the hard questions um, such as um, do our methods of instruction and, and do, do our content and curriculum draw from the experiences of our students? Are we engaged in the right professional learning? Um, how are we connecting it to our practice? How are we keeping our parents informed and things of that nature? Um, I won't read off the names of the people on here, but I will just leave it for a minute so that we can acknowledge and thank them for the, the participation in the root cause analysis, for the feedback on the plan and for their continued monitoring and input as we engage in this 27 month cycle. Uh, of note is there's principals, there's school psychologists, there's gen ed teachers, there's special ed teachers, even our county SELPA director is part of our stakeholder team, as well as parents. So very robust conversations were had in our stakeholder meetings, even over Zoom, in breakout rooms, on all the other components of the plan. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Wagner to talk about the root causes and, and lead us into the development of our plan. Thank you, Ms. Lockridge. Um, after review of the relevant data, um, our team engaged in a root cause analysis of the problem so that we could fully understand how to compensate for and learn from the underlying issues within that root cause. You know, engaging in this process allowed us to identify all of the potential factors that have caused Santa Barbara Unified to over identify Latinx students for special education under the qualification of specific learning disability. Now to guide us in this process, we utilize the Wisconsin Department of Education annotative checklist for uh, addressing racial disproportionality in special ed. And as our leadership team worked through this lengthy process, you know, we really had to be honest about our existing beliefs. And when I say our, I mean our district. Um, our, our district's existing beliefs as well as, as our practices, our policies, our procedures. Um, this honesty was essential because the ultimate goal um, is really to apply what we learned from this analysis so that we systematically prevent this disproportionality from continuing and ensure that we identify what we're doing right so that we can repeat those successes in our action plan. But it was a very, very important process. So the, the Wisconsin protocol required us to work through three areas of focus. Uh, the first area of focus was district and school resource issues. Um, there were a variety of issues, but some of those included um, proven programs of effective instruction for emergent multilingual students, um, school leader understanding and use of data to identify issues, discuss remedies with staff and evaluate interventions, and also um, professional learning for teachers on how to make proper referrals to intervention for emergent multilingual students. Our second area of focus um, looked at system policies, procedures, and practice issues. Um, these included, but weren't limited to um, being rigorous in our attempts to rule out um, EML status and instructional deficiencies um, as predominant factors 
before progressing with a determination of special ed eligibility. Um, also, we looked at um, the routine sharing of disaggregated data for analysis by both regular and special ed special educators. We looked at whether that was happening um, and also the quality of instruction and classroom management, um, the way in which um, referring general ed teachers um, manage their classroom and provide that quality instruction. And then finally, in this area of focus, we looked at racial disparity patterns among teacher referrals to student success teams and the attitude of teachers with regards to um, special education and students receiving special education services. Finally, um, the third area of focus were environmental factors. And, and these included everything from kindergarten screening processes to the impact of risks within the community, such as exposure to environmental toxins, uh, trauma, poverty. And also we looked at the impact of school transfers and our open enrollment policy. So at this point, um, I'd like to transition and briefly share the six root causes we identified through this process. Uh, next slide, please. So first, um, the district does not have clear and consistent systems to help intervene for students that are based on data. Um, that is to say that we have no, no formal multi-tiered system of support that provides a system by which educators can work together to ensure equitable access and opportunity for all students. Uh, I do want to point out that it was really good to see in the SIPSAs tonight that our, our principals are calling out MTSS and they're, they're aware of the need um, for um, intervention systems that are based on data. So that was encouraging. Uh, number two, we lack data analysis tools, protocols and practices. And, and while we do have access to data, that data is not readily accessible to all users. It's not um, something that's at our fingertips. And furthermore, our protocols and practices for making sense of that data is inconsistent across schools and between uh, departments. So we need to establish consistency of practices. Um, number three, Explicit native and second language development is not evident in first level instruction. So improving our practices in this regard requires us to use an asset based approach to our students who are struggling. Next, um, you know, the parental understanding of rights and access to legal support is lacking. Um, we need to be completely aware of the need to educate and prepare the parents and guardians of students who struggle so that they can completely understand the implications of having their children become eligible for special education. It's our responsibility to make sure that our guidance and support is culturally and linguistically appropriate for those families. Number five, um, Conscious and unconscious racial and linguistic biases exist and they negatively influence perceptions of our students' abilities. We're in an age when having an awareness of our own biases uh, and being able to tag and identify those biases when they arise is absolutely an essential skill, especially as educators. And finally, number six, um, we need to ensure that we provide professional development to administrators, teachers, and, and educational specialists. 
in order to close um, gaps between knowledge and implementation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Shetler spoke earlier of the risk ratio and, and just to review, a, a risk ratio is a, a, just simply a numerical comparison that's expressed as a ratio or decimal. And it's between the risk of a specific outcome for a specific racial or ethnic group in a district and the risk of that same outcome for all other children in the district. So we're going to I'm going to say it for a third time tonight because I think it bears repeating over and over again that as of 2018-19 Latinx students enrolled in Santa Barbara Unified were 3.43 times as likely as other ethnic groups to be qualified for special education services under the designation of specific learning disability. Our short-term goal short-term goal is to reduce this ratio to 3.0 by September of 2022, with the ultimate goal of leveling the risk with all other ethnic groups to an even 1.0. So to achieve um, both the short-term and ultimate goal, our action plan is made of uh, seven activities. And I'm going to now turn the presentation over to Ana Escobedo, our Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Ed, who will talk to you about our initial target group and introduce the first activity. Thank you, Dr. Wagonek and team. I'm so humbled and honored to be part of this amazing uh, group uh, and, and effort. Uh, so how uh, were we able to determine our, our target group? There was a data discovery portion to this process in order to identify our district's target group and the data revealed the following. Our emergent multilingual learner students or our EMLs, also known as our ELs or English learners, have a three times higher disproportionate rate of qualifying for special education services. I wanna say that one more time. Our EMLs have a three times higher rate of qualifying for special education services. Our discovery also led us to understanding that our uh, special education department had to go even deeper than that. And their analysis uh, of over of analyzing the last two school years data found that when looking at ethnicity and language status data, we found that language status was a greater predictor for student qualification, more so than ethnicity. So although our qualifying status for this, uh, where we find ourselves with the state is for Latinx students, our deeper dive revealed that our identified students were not only Latinx, but they were also, they were Latinx and emergent multilingual learners. We also found that the grade level of initial identification was greater in third grade, allowing us to zero in on the target group and also a prevention group while this target group, as mentioned earlier, is obviously our focus and, and our required um, target right now, our efforts and our goal is to make sure that all of these activities that you will be hearing about in, in totality this plan will allow for best practices and systems to support all of our students' differentiating needs. Our estimated 148 EMLs in second and in the second and third grade target group will be our primary focus at Cleveland, Franklin, and Monroe Elementary School. Next slide. So now that we know who the target groups are at, or is, what do we do to support them and ultimately all of our students when they need support? Our state framework for multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS, which you've heard a little bit about already, 
provides a basis for understanding how educators can work together to ensure equitable access and opportunity for all students for academic and behavioral needs. In tier one, which is the base of the pyramid that you see here, all kids get everything. A strong preventive and proactive approach to accessing core quality instruction. For 80 to 90% of our students, this will be all they need. Tier two, which is the middle of our pyramid here, will provide some kids with a little more in addition to everything that they are already getting in tier one. This will be supplemental and targeted interventions and about five to 10% of our students uh, will need this type of tier two support to improve their outcomes. Then finally, at the top of the pyramid, we have tier three. And tier three provides few students with an addition, an ad additional layer, uh, starting with tier one. In addition to tier one, they will get two, tier two uh, support. And then in addition to tier two, they will also be receiving strategic and intensive interventions in the tier three based on their very specific individual needs. This could be or lead to special education services for one to 8% of our students. Next slide. So what good is a plan without the actions, right? These are our actions and our activities and probably what I'm most excited about. So given that we currently have not established a clear and consistent database system of interventions and supports, uh, we are starting with activity one being to adopt a district-wide multi-tiered system of support framework for Santa Barbara Unified. This will allow us to define the MTSS process in order to establish a systemic understanding to implement research-based framework for appropriate prevention, enrichment, and intervention starting January through March, 2021. That's our first phase or our next phase, I should say. We, this will also allow us to provide professional development for site administrators and teams starting from April through June, 2021. And of course, knowing that that will be our ongoing work. And this will also uh, provide us a part, allow us to partner with a consultant uh, recommended by the California Department of Ed uh, to help guide this initial work around the framework adoption, around implementation specific to our district and ensuring that it is inclusive of professional learning district wide. So now I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Wagnick so she can talk to you more about our next actions, activity two. Thank you, Ms. Escobedo. The, um, so our second activity is the fortification of our student study or student success team. Um, the, the student study team, also commonly called student success team, is a, a team oriented approach uh, to assisting students um, who are struggling with a wide range of concerns that are related to school performance um, and, and behavior and, and student experiences. Um, the purpose of the SST is to identify and intervene early in order to design a support system for students who are having difficulty in the general education classroom. And you can see from the graphic here that um, a proper um, SST is, is based on a, a cycle of um, improvement um, where uh, when a student is struggling, we divide, define what the problem is. We analyze um, why it's occurring. We implement a plan um, to to implement interventions and, and then we evaluate whether it's working or not. And ultimately, hopefully that student uh, returns to the first tier of, of the MTSS cycle. 
Um, but one of our honest reflections uh, when we did the root cause analysis um, was that we do not have uh, a robust SST um, system in this district. And this is something that um, many of us have, have known for quite a while. And so actually last um, September, September of 2019, um, we began piloting a rebranding of the SST process. And again, I will point you back to the, the SIPSA plans, uh, though it's reflected there. Um, I, I'll point you to, you can look at Santa Barbara High School, you can look at uh, La Colina Junior High, you can uh, look at um, Santa Barbara Community Academy, and um, also within um, the ninth grade at Dos Pueblos, where there was a, a piloting of this rebranded process, which we call the Le Le learner, sorry, it's getting late, the learner intervention team. Um, we, we went so far as to completely rename the process. And so that is currently ongoing. Um, we need to also, as we um, create this new system, include an emphasis on language appraisal uh, within the team um, by including an expert on language um, access and providing other members of the team with professional learning on language appraisal. Um, we have to be intentional about looking at language um, when we are um, asking the question, why is this occurring when a student is struggling? Um, we'll be evaluating the uh, learner intervention team pilots um, this spring by gathering data on student outcomes. We'll also um, this spring be training administrators and school site teams on learner intervention teams, um, including the, that language appraisal piece. Um, our goal is to implement the learner intervention team process at the target sites um, this spring and then across all school sites in 2021-22. Uh, and then finally, throughout our rollout of this learner intervention team model, um, we will evaluate, refine, and revise our practices. So the uh, expected cost of this rebranding and retooling of, uh, of the SST process uh, will be about $26,000 um, and that will be expended on language appraisal training and the teacher release time uh, required to train our teachers. And now I am um, happy to turn it over to our Executive Director of Diversity, Equity and Family Engagement, Ms. Maria Larios Horton. Thank you, Dr. Wagenek. Um, so for activity number three, um, a key takeaway from this uh, particular activity is that intervention for culturally and linguistically diverse students must be different from support given to monolingual English speaking students. That has been made very clear by the research. As stated in our district's META plan, a deficit orientation towards our culturally and linguistically diverse students must be reversed toward a more assets-based approach that takes into consideration the funds of knowledge students already bring with them to the classroom. Activity three seeks to develop a culturally and linguistically responsive system for intervention when students are experiencing challenges with learning, also called a tier two intervention system. This includes the establishment of an EML instructional support team hired to help students using assets oriented and research based interventions. This would also include professional learning and tools for all participating administrators and teachers. Next slide please. 
And so in this activity, number four, um, language support in native language and explicit language development in English are critical to EML student achievement. So first, with regard to support with native language, extensive research has found that the home language of EMLs is of considerable benefit to the overall academic success of our students. Educational programs that incorporate use of EML's home language result in high levels of academic success, including achievement in literacy and other academic subjects. Children who are learning to read in a second language are able to transfer many skills and knowledge from their first language to facilitate their acquisition of reading skills in the home language. On the second language, the best evidence of this comes from studies showing that students with strong reading skills in the home language also have strong reading skills in their second language. Much of this work has been done in, uh, with ELLs in the United States. Now, with regard to explicit English language development, there are two key efforts afoot. As you may recall, we just recently adopted and are in the initial stages of implementation of a science-based designated English language development curriculum for all EMLs in our district with a team of expert consultants supporting the ongoing professional learning for our educators. In addition, our district will be investing in a new online ELD standards aligned English language proficiency assessment that would provide more timely and formative information for teachers to use in designing learning for their EMLs. To this end, professional learning will be required for staff at all levels of this implementation. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. John Shetler. Thank you, Maria. The previous slides have focused on changes that would occur before students are referred for a special education assessment. However, we also want to ensure that our process for evaluating students for special education is non-discriminatory in terms of how students' cultural and linguistic backgrounds are considered by school staff. We are proposing that the district review and revise its procedures for assessing emergent multilingual learners for special education we're fortunate to have a group of preschool and elementary school psychologists who have been leading in this area by gathering best practices from the field. We anticipate a need to purchase additional testing tools and training for our assessment teams. We have also heard from families that in hindsight, they did not always understand the implications of having their children become eligible for special education. For example, families have shared that they were led to believe that an IEP was the next logical step in getting their child academic help. We want to ensure that our revised procedures include a more thorough explanation of what it means when a child qualifies for an IEP. Parents deserve to know which general education supports and interventions were attempted prior to a special education referral. And I apologize for all the back and forth handoffs, but we got one more, I'm gonna send it back to Mrs. Maria Larius Horton to discuss activities six and seven and wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Shetler. <clears throat> In this particular activity, um, we address the root cause of unconscious and uh, conscious and unconscious racial and linguistic biases and how that negatively influences perceptions of student abilities. It is imperative as state implementation models also indicate that we continue and expand implicit bias training in our district, which also leads to changes in policy and practice that placed our district on CDE's significant disproportionality list for Latinx students. The costs identified here are for professional learning in this area to include not just staff, but also our families. Next slide, thank you. This is, um, our, our last activity, but also um, a very important activity um, with a district-wide initiative uh, that would allow us to hire bilingual teachers, especially in the early grades of K-3. Um, we would be looking to uh, identify methods for, of, of recruitment um, and retention uh, for bilingual teachers 
which would include um, intentional and appropriate hiring practices for language and sociocultural competence. So in other words, the teachers uh, that we would be looking for and um, the hiring practices that we would employ would be specific to ensuring that those folks that we do hire uh, come to us with uh, high levels of, of language proficiency in a target language, in this case, Spanish, and sociocultural competence or cultural proficiency. We would also look to strengthen university partnerships and also look to explore other university partnerships that would help us in this, um, in this process. We would also explore possible incentives for teachers, bilingual teachers. As we know, many other districts employ this particular practice. And then last but not least, least we would also look to focus on grow our own within our districts classified and certificated staff, such as the PEAK initiative, where we have been able to hire our own peaks, peak stu former PEAK students to become teachers in our district. And I believe this is our first year in implementing that, um, that initiative fully with teachers in classrooms already. Um, and so why is this particular activity important? It's important because we understand that students' first language is key to their learning and progress. And this would allow for us to do the work of prevention uh, in, this, in this particular case. And so with that, we conclude and we uh, want to thank you and remind us that the focus on students' cultural and linguistic assets helps us to get at the root of the issues outlined in this plan and will ask us to think differently about what is best for students who already bring rich native language and cultural resources to our classrooms. And some might consider this approach, some approaches radical, but indeed that is what we need. Thank you. All right, and with that, we will uh, turn it over to, uh, back to the board uh, for your questions and comments. Thank you, and uh, Mr. Ross, if you can take down the PowerPoint, thank you. Dr. Reed? Yes, yeah, I was, uh, so uh, Ms. Katz um, is not feeling well, so I'm gonna take over. Um, what I'd like to um, do, I do think we have a speaker, Moni DeWitt, so if we could um, bring the public. Um, She's already spoken to this item, Dr. Reed. Okay. Am I correct, Sandra? Um, she spoke to the item of, um, the CISPA, it's, it's, she spoke the, to the CIPSIS. CIPSIS, thank you. So no speakers for this item, correct? Okay. We do have Moni DeWitt. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we do have Moni DeWitt. Yes. Okay. Well, Moni start, uh, hello, thank you so much, Sandra. I appreciate it. And yeah, I did sign up to speak. I'm not sure if you're all hearing me because I just have a black screen. Um, yes, anyway, are, are we good? We hear you. Okay, I'm so sorry. So listen, I, I find this conversation fascinating and many of the things that you have proposed as far as, far as you know, being culturally respective and inclusive, those are all good. But there's two things you continually ignore the question I ask, which I think I deserve an answer to, and which is founded in every, you know, data there is. But Lucy Calkins is not the thing for special ed kids because it's not explicit enough. And that's the same for English language learners. The reason why you have a disproportionate amount of English language learners in special ed is because the whites and the Asians have more means and they get tutoring and they get out of that 25 percentile. I'm very concerned about our English language learners. I think a lot of the social emotional practices you are supporting are, are good, but you are missing a, an incredibly important piece and your scores are gonna be stagnant forever. And it pains me to be observing this for decades. In the last three years, we're, we're very hard. The Parent Resource Center has been dead, Mr. Shetler, appointment only that was given by Tobes by you know um, Orfila everybody poured into that and you don't even respect the history and and that is something 
that our English language learners' parents could go in there with tapes. That's how I learned to advocate for my son. Bilingual, we have a resource that's been squandered. And it goes on and on. But the key thing that I really want a response to out of complete respect for me, trying to respect you and be on the same page is that Lucy Calkins balanced literacy doesn't work. She came out herself and said, and that's because we're neurologically wired differently. And we need dyslexics like myself and my son and other people I've advocated for. We need an explicit approach, which is the science of reading and a variety of other things but Lucy Calkins doesn't cut it. And you know this, John, and many of the white people of means get settlements because they can afford a lawyer and they fight it out and they get something better. But the people socioeconomically disadvantaged who I advocate for, and I'm even a wimpy advocate compared to Sherry Ray and Joan Esposito, but for decades, there are people who are silently thrown under the bus because they need an explicit approach and they're not getting it. So please, for the love of God, drop Lucy Calkins and consider something else and do automatic testing in K through three. Don't whittle around, test everybody and everybody who's lagging, get those parents on there also to support and the community. We need to work together and your stakeholders are limited and you should be inviting advocates and you should be welcoming differences because you're missing stuff and you're gonna fail again. Sorry, I respect you, good night. Thank you very much um, for our public comment. And um, it's important to have public comment and perspective. Uh, moving forward though, I would like to say that I'm very impressed with this plan and this comprehensive way of looking at this issue. Uh, I appreciated the work that has gone into it and the activities that are being aligned to find and uh, to dive deeper into finding ways that we can support our students and not situate ourselves in this way. But I'm going to pause there and move to um, to the board and see if there's anyone who would like to raise questions or comments with regards to the report. Ms. Ford. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, I have a few questions. Um, some are easy to answer. First one for Ms. Maldonado. Um, where are we on the creation of the data dashboard that um, sounded so great and I think we approved the contract for it because this seems to be a, a, an integral part of um, this plan and also the SIPSAs is that this district needs to have better ways of collecting and looking at data. Thank you for the question. And I believe Mr. Rouse will correct me if I misspeak, but we are currently validating the transfer of data between the dashboard and, the, and our systems, um, ARIES and others. Once that process is completed, which we expect to be done by the end of this month, we will start to look at some samples and pilot some of the visualization tools so that we can start working with our staff by January. Am I correct, Mr. Rouse? Yes, that's correct. Great, thanks. And um, the other thing is that I do wanna say that this is a very comprehensive plan um, on a very complicated topic, but there still are a few holes for me. First of all, the identification of the three schools. I don't really know how that happened and or why. And now that these three schools have been identified, what's been the response of the schools and how they reacted to the data and the plan? So All I right, take part of that. John, you wanna take it? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the, how did they get selected piece? We looked at our special education referral data, um, 10 different ways. We looked at which schools had the highest percentages of students who were eligible under SLD, which ones were EL, which ones were Hispanic. Um, ultimately, one of the data points that spoke loudest to us was the percentage of students who were eligible for special ed period at our schools when you excluded the students who were in our moderate to severe programs. And the three schools that we're targeting were one, two, and three in terms of the highest overall percentage of special education. I think right. um, Sierra is probably better suited to talk about how this has been received by, by those sites. 
And yeah, thank you, John. Um, I think that the sites, I think it's something we've all known and, and, and really just glad that we're at this place now that we're digging in and doing the important work. So I would say that they are receptive and I would even note that you can see evidence of the, the awareness and the um, actions in their respective SIPSAs, which you just approved today. So there's definitely that connection being made and they're looking forward to being a part of this work and, and monitoring uh, the, these endeavors with us as well. Thanks, and then just two more. The activity number four has all allocated $240,000 for certain positions. Are these tutoring positions? Sierra, you want to talk about those positions? Sure. So activity number four um, has to do with having similar to picking up on some of the things that we learned from the dyslexia project to, uh, to be quite transparent is of having a, a coach type role. Um, this would be someone who would lead a team of curriculum specialists to be doing the emergent multilingual systematic intervention that we think is needed. So we're really thinking about a team approach where one coordinator type role that we will be bringing to the board for approval after this gets approved by the state um, to kind of oversee the data collection and the monitoring of it. And then the sites would have a respective um, emergent multilingual curriculum specialist that would really focus on the tier two piece. So having a, a systematic tier two approach. And, so, and to clarify, we're looking at, at hiring certificated teachers to serve as coaches. So uh, that's where that funding comes from. And that funding will not cover the entire cost of those individuals, but will be utilized in that way. And so, uh, Sarah, you're saying four positions then? Um, well, no, ultimately we're looking to supplement this with a Title I or Low Achievement Block Grant because we're not just trying to make change at the three target schools. We're trying to make systematic change. So we're looking to extend not only the work that we're doing with MTSS, adopting a, a appropriate SST, but having this go across all nine sites. The only money that would be targeted is for those three schools because that would be from the SIGDIS allocation that we talked about at the beginning, the 371,000. The rest we will, you, we will um, fund in other ways, but we do believe that the, the tier two is a critical piece um, and having it done in a, in a way that's systematic and respectful of our emergent multilinguals and using the best uh, practices is going to make the most uh, impact. So the, the funds you see are for the, the coach type person and then just the three at the three schools, the other six will be funded separately. Right, so all I was doing was confirming that there would be four with this particular funding. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and then um, there's another uh, like three part question that I always like to ask. So I don't know who wants to take it but I call it the Goldilocks question. And it basically just gets it down to the to the root of everything, which is what are we going to stop doing? What are we going to keep doing because it's working? And what do we need to accelerate or do more of? Well, I'm gonna to try to take it now as friend to help. Uh, we're gonna stop treating all kids like they learn the same way and pretending that kids that don't speak the language that they're being taught to read in is uh, automatic and that they should have comprehension when we know that their level of proficiency in English is not at the level that we would expect someone whose language is English for, as a first language. We're going to start to look at the work through a system, uh, organizational system lens, so that we set up systems and structures that look for who is not learning and what are we gonna do for them and how do we accelerate for those that are learning. Um, so that was, Start, start and stop. And was the last part? Um, more of. Keep doing because we're more really of. working. <laughs> well, what we do, what we need to do more of is looking, uh, developing more expertise for teachers in identifying how um, we need to support our English learners. I'll give you a quick example. When we look at assessments, 
And I like that Moni keeps bringing up this uh, Lucy Calkins and some of the work that we've been doing with balanced literacy. If you're giving the same assessments to the kids, but not analyzing them through a second language learning lens and uh, scoring children lower than they should be, if you're providing the same lessons in phonics, but not paying attention to the sounds in language that are different for Spanish speakers, Chinese speakers, or others, and not looking at those kinds of uh, nuances in second language learning and literacy, then we're gonna you know, continue to get the same results. So we have designed this system in Santa Barbara to get the results that we're getting. So we're gonna stop doing that and uh, really focus our attention in every single plan that we have so that as a system, we move in the same direction. Thank you so much. I don't know if you agree, but I think it really helps sometimes to look at problems that way. Just those questions. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna steal that. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Reed. Yeah, other board members. Hi. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate um, where we're going with that, particularly your comments, uh, Superintendent Maldonado, with regards to can we look at the Lucy Lucy Hawkins? I know she's been saying it for four years that I've been here. So can we at least address it after we do a different or something like that? So I appreciate we're looking at it from a different perspective uh, because she keeps saying it keep saying it, but we don't necessarily address it because we keep saying it. So hopefully we're gonna be able to do that. And then secondly, I see across four of the activities or most of the activities, there's about 83,000 in just professional learning. And I don't know the breakout in activity three because it's part of the 240. Is there a different professional learning for each activity or in general? Then? Each, um, each activity has a different um, professional learning that goes along with it, um, different specific. So for example, uh, the language appraisal piece, we need training in that. We need training still in, in analyzing um, data and, and how do gen ed and special ed teachers work together to analyze data. So um, this was really pinpointing the specific um, professional learning that needed to take place in each of those activities. Okay, and then the other question I have is, because you know, we, we learned early on when we came in the board that there was a significant amount of over-identification for special ed, particularly for our Latin students. So will this system reduce that over-identification? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because, the and, and if I couldn't top Ms. Maldonado's response to the stop, keep and more, question, but the one thing we're going to stop doing is jumping right from tier one to tier three, because we're going to establish really robust tier two um, interventions and have a system by which um, we're able to provide students with support and then move them back to tier one um, when the time comes. So, you know, there will still be a Latinx children who are identified with specific learning disabilities. Um, but that's what we're going to do is those will be the students who absolutely need it. And it'll be after we've thrown everything we possibly can at them to provide them with supports and their parents are going to understand that and, and what's going on throughout the process. I'm getting a little excited right now because mm -hmm. this is pretty awesome work and, and we're going to do it. So appreciate that and I believe that it will happen. And so I would just step back a further and ask, so how does any early identification help with this? Meaning early identification development delays in the early, you know, of our younger kids. So again, linking it to early identification and looking at early development delays, how does that link to this? Or have we thought about linking it to that? Do you want to take that, John? Yeah, you know, that, that came up in an interesting way. We don't have kindergartners with identified learning disabilities because they haven't been in school long enough for us to see that kind of gap emerge where we you know have reason to believe that they have a learning disability but we do have kids come in through preschool and kindergarten maybe with a speech delay and so they already have an IEP one of the things that we talked about is that if we keep looking at our kids through a deficit model it's really easy to sort of pathologize everything that we see with them and in special education, we certainly tend to do that. So when we develop an IEP for a student, we're looking at what are their needs? Let's come up with goals for that. And when we see a kid who 
who maybe just has a speech delay struggling in reading, if we don't have the right people sitting around the table to say, maybe the reason they're struggling with reading is we need to adjust their ELD, we can go quickly to let's find another disability to explain why the student is struggling. So there is an early identification layer to this and how we um, keep looking at what the, what, what the students are bringing to the table and how to consider their language acquisition along the way. That really was the, the common theme when we looked at the data was our, our EML students are the ones that we were really misinterpreting all kinds of signs for. And then just add, oh, sorry, uh, Ms. Sinswell, let me just add that uh, in the earlier conversation with the positions we're buying, uh, in Santa Barbara Unified, our SST teams do not require a, an expert in, in EML issues at the table. And so that is going to be a, an immediate change to the, to the workflow because you cannot be assessing a student that's an EML and not have somebody at the table who's an expert in the learning uh, for that student. So this money and these investments are meant to do that, to make that change immediate. Yeah, and, and so I just say that, you know, maybe when you say, John, um, about looking at a deficit model, maybe that's a change in language of how we look early on in terms of what are we looking for to say, hey, this isn't really, it's language, and so we, maybe we need to address it this way. So that's why it's important to keep linking early, but maybe we have to look at it differently through a different set of eyes, such as we're doing tonight. Thank so you. Ms. Sims Moten, I'd like to just address, I, you asked earlier about the professional development and where, you know, how is it differentiated? What you just said right now is exactly where we need to start. That professional development really needs to begin with the understanding of one, how do we really support in tier one? How do we address the needs of our emergent um, multilingual learners um, to be able to really address their de language development needs without misidentifying those or misinterpreting those into maybe a disability or 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 a deficit right um, the other thing is in, in order to be able to do that well in tier one does not matter what program or approach we have in in uh, for language arts uh, if we still do not fully comprehend as a system. This means our teachers, this means educating our parents, this means educating um, administrators and, and, and the learning be in the process of how to support language development, then we will always have whatever percentage of students we have in, in uh, EM, as EMLs, in this case 50%, that are not reaching their maximum uh, potential uh, because in the tier one, we are not addressing their language needs. So um, I think for me, that that's that's my passion, right? Uh, because it, it doesn't matter what program. A program is not uh, the magic, uh, a, we want a magic pill sometimes or, or an easy fix. It is not an easy fix. It is a, it's an important understanding of who our students are and what their needs are um, in all the different uh, development stages, especially for um, in, when it comes to language. Yeah, and I really appreciate you saying that because you know the, the, the mission of First Five is to uh, have all kindergartens ready to go when they get here, right? And so again, I, I had that when you have those articulating conversations early on as we're developing a strategic plan, maybe that's something that we want to focus on learning, having focus on language development. You know, what does, what does it look like in, you know, in uh, supporting the parents in helping do that? So we can certainly take a little later time to talk about that, how we can really start to do that. Because I really want us to be this very powerful P through 12 district. And I think that we can start there, then we can certainly make sure that it, a lot of this is, is um, it's after the fact. And if we can get more of it on the early side, I think then we'll have more time to be more intensive with those that we just, you know, miss along the way. Right. I, I would love I would love to add too. Um, let's not forget that um, our activity seven also asks of our district to shore up our elementary K three spaces, our classrooms with bilingual educators, and that is a huge need in our district. Um, and so, by doing that, we would have teachers in classrooms who who fully understand language acquisition and literacy. Um, so that's really exciting as well as um, I'm sure you know, uh, Ms. Sims-Moten, that there is a, a very exciting uh, 
proposal on the table to have dual uh, language learner professional learning for our pre -K, our pre K uh, and younger students that also focuses on helping our teachers build capacity around instruction in the first language. So that is very exciting. And I couldn't agree with you more that this has to start when they're very little, um, very young. And the moment that they enter any classroom um, here in our, in, our, in our city, we need to be able to acknowledge that that first language instruction is going to be key even at that young of an age, so. Well, thank you. That leads me back to my next, I was actually gonna be my last comment on that time practice. And I really appreciate that and certainly know that that's, that's critical. But I would just go a little bit farther in terms of we, as we're promote, you know, we're focusing on making sure that the right teacher with the right training is in, in the classrooms. And so it's, it's just as important you know, some one of the, the huge uh, Santa Barbara Black youth demands was uh, making sure that we have culturally relevant student, uh, teachers in our classroom. So let's not forget that because it's really like it's like, you know, it's it's kind of like on the side, you know. So when we're when our hiring practices, this certainly is in terms of vibing and making sure that we have the right folks in that not only from a linguistic end, but also from a cultural end. So I don't want us to forget that that was huge, and we need to make sure that we're talking about that overall as we look at this at this whole system. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yes, I'd also like to, you know, certainly um, I agree with Ms. Sims Malton in terms of the culture and building on that as, as a strength base. Um, and, you know, as you said, like our Black students, our Native American students, you know, and, and such, so that it's built on that. Because, of course, culture, language, it's interchangeable, right? It has um, one goes with the other. And, um, and just having that self-perception, you know, um, being an English learner myself back in the day, uh, I was fortunate that I was able to build on my language. You know, um, my brother did it. He lost his, the language and a lot of the culture and so forth. Um, and so I certainly, you know, agree with the importance of the culture, the support with the language and the native language and then building on that. Um, <clears throat> And also very much, you know, I like the activity four in terms of the diagram and the family involvement, um, having this be understandable for the parents so that it's in language that they under, that's understandable um, so that they're able to ask questions and decide, you know, for their child and be able to advocate for their own child um, or children. And I also am very supportive of the, you know, bilingual teachers being hired with background knowledge of their own community. Um, with, you know, Black teachers, we need that. LGBTQ, you know, I had this a lot with uh, foster kids where I would go with them to the school to the IEP meeting and all the file um, was there. And, you know, of course, with them, it was even an added difficulty with them going through the system um, and someone to advocate for them that was consistent. You know, unfortunately, they'd have one social worker and then it would change over and so forth. And, and by you know, junior high, it was very difficult to try to um, <clears throat> instill you know, self confidence and so forth. So I very much like you know, the framework and then also um, looking at this in, in the younger grades. And then also, obviously, you know, as you can tell, very excited about it um, so that we don't have to depend on what school a student goes to, what they are able to benefit from in terms of having the framework throughout our district. Thank you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one other thing? I think it's always important to have a story. Um, so with regards to this, um, in terms of how it's, it's really important through this whole process to make sure that we're asking the students what's their experience through this whole thing. It's so important to have that. I had a second grader who was identified for an IEP and, you know, for special ed. And, and when it really came about, it really wasn't, it, it was just an assumption that that's where you need to go because you're not learning, you're not engaged. When really asked that question, it, it so what was happening in your class when finally someone asked that question? He goes, it's like still water, it's going nowhere. Meaning he was not engaged. And because he wasn't engaged, he got identified with an IEP and special ed. 
But when they started to ask him what his thoughts were, then it was like, oh, that's what he's thinking. That's what he's hearing. So let us not, in the, in the midst of all this, not lose sight of the, the, the student's experience. Oftentimes that will tell us, that will identify a whole lot more than just if you're just taking the data. The data also has to have the experience of the student or the one who's most closely impacted by what we're trying to do. But I don't want to, I want to make sure that we're including that as well in this process. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. I, I, would, I would just add to that in that, um, I think the intent of this whole document is to align it with culturally relevant pedagogy. So essentially to really look at ensuring that each student is engaged because the curriculum is going to support their culture and their, their ways of thinking so that they are more apt to engage and want to take part and take up the knowledge. So I think that is consistent across this, this report. And it's, it's exciting to me to say that this has been something that I have been behind for many, many years and to see it happening with a comprehensive plan, with activities that support it and professional development support that. When I think back to many years ago, we were just looking at the curriculum saying, well, it's, it's just missing, it's missing these things. And now we have this plan that is really going to the root and devising strategies across the process for, for our students. I, I'm thrilled to, to go out knowing that this is coming in. <laughs> and, um, and so I just wanna thank everybody who's been involved. Um, I mean, all of you are, are just bring such great perspectives and knowledge and expertise and uh, keep on keeping on. I look forward to hearing how it progresses. I'm also looking at the clock and realizing that we're all bleary eyed and that this report is, we're gonna hear more about it, but um, I, I want to, um, if, unless there's any more board questions. I actually, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I just have a couple yeah. of announcements before we wrap up. Sure, I didn't know if there was any more comments for this particular report. If not. Um, so I, I actually had a, a, com a quick comment, just a brief comment. I, I first, I really appreciate um, Ms. Sims Moten uh, mentioning, you know, uh, the students' experience, I think it's it's critical, and I think it's something we need to look at when when we are um, implementing this plan. I also want us to I want to encourage us to go back to the meta plan, which um, in our exploration of a uh, root causes, we did extensive interviews with students in our district, including elementary school students, and you would be surprised to find, or maybe not that a lot of what is in this plan was actually revealed to us by students already. Um, so I just wanna remind us that um, those, the results of those interviews and the qualitative uh, research did employ a lot of um, student voice. Um, so I just wanted to remind us that that's there, but also to um, also have us think about that when we proceed with this plan as well. Thank you. Yes, I just want to announce a couple of upcoming events. Next week, we're going to have our elementary schools uh, parent conference week. So uh, parents who just, or board members, if you're going to be uh, around, we, we have that happening next week. Also, board members, you should have received uh, information regarding an upcoming uh, conference, uh, December 3rd and December 4th. It's a virtual conference with CSBA. It's an annual conference that we will be attending together. And of course, because this is a month of uh, gratitude with Thanksgiving as our holiday, I would just want to make sure that we all remind ourselves to thank all those people that support every, each and every one of us that are here today to make sure that we make this work happen for children. So thank you. Thank you. Any other coming board members? The only comment is to stay safe, make sure we're socially distancing. Eat turkey, but in a socially distanced way, wash your hands, <laughs> wear your mask, only drop it when you have to eat. So just really stay safe because we want to make sure that we're getting back in, in person. So. <laughs> right. And thank you so much for this setup and our ability to be able to have our, our final meeting with Dr. Reed in the board. <laughs> so thank you for all for putting that together and making that happen. So. Yeah, I really much appreciate all, all of that was done this evening and uh, I'm just overwhelmed and uh, anyway, before we set that. <laughs>
I do want to say um, for future agenda items, I will leave saying again, I'm hoping it comes on the agenda um, for a student board member to, or a plan that, that I had requested that would come forward in December. So I believe that's still on the docket and I would hope that it, it can come forward um, in December. So I'm seeing a nod of heads, so I'm very, very happy about that. I am confident it's coming forward. It'll be your legacy. Agenda item. All right. Um, well, with that, I would say, um, I hope Laura feels better. I hope that she uh, feels better. And I just, again, thank all of you for this privilege and honor to be a part of this board. And I am out there in the community supporting you 100,000%. And just know that you can always reach me. So thank you so much. And this will be my gavel. I will now conclude. <laughs>